Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon devoted to the seismic assessment strategies for mesonry restructures. Stadata and Premuri Project are very proud to present you a panel of distinguished professors and engineers from all over Europe. So I would like to thank them all for having wanted to share today with us their interesting lectures and case studies. I would like also to mention our distributors that have worked this month along side by side with us uh, to let you all be here today. So thank you to Ingwer for Switzerland and Austria, Technosoft, the Netherlands, Idisti, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Serbia, Ergocad, Greece and Cyprus, Anashimoes for Portugal. We would like to introduce you briefly to who Stadata is and our activities in terms of software development, and we will do that with a very short video. But before that, the greatest thank you goes to Professor Andrea Penna, University of Pavia, who accepted again this year to be the chairman and key speaker for this event. I hand over to you, Andrea. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank you and enjoy. STA Data was founded in 1983 by Adriano Castagnone, civil and structural engineer since 1978, and pioneer of scientific software for structural engineering. The company was born to provide civil engineering services and consulting. We have always had a particular interest in the evolving sector of IT, foreseeing the enormous opportunity of applying it in design and computation. Before focusing on software development, STIA Data realized important projects, both with private and state-owned companies. That's our strength, because besides IT experts, we are professional in structural design. The company is currently composed by 15 employees and several consultants, all highly professional qualified. Thanks to the continuous development of work and collaboration with the university and professional world, it is always able to offer advanced and constant updates to its customers. Application STA Data allows you to face everyday work with simplicity and effectiveness. The company goal does not end with the, research, with the search of new IT solutions. The offer of STA Data includes support, training and consulting services including individual projects, so that the professionals are immediately operational. Thanks to the technical expertise and the state-of-the-art solution, STA Data is a solution to the real problems of designers. I think that we can now start the real activity of, the, of this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Andrea Penna. I think that most of you, uh, at least the, at least the panelists, uh, know, um, know me, as well as I well know all of them. And uh, I take the opportunity to thank all the attendees, all the people that they are joining this uh, this seminar. I see now there are now more than 120 participants. Uh, this is a, a very nice opportunity because this is the second uh, event, international event regarding uh, the Tremuri community, I would say, that the users uh, worldwide and uh, the uh, research professionals uh, involved in the uh, activities of the of Tremuri. I, I personally want to thank the, for their participation for their participation, uh, Professor Rita Bento of the University of Lisbon, Instituto Superior Tecnico, uh, Professor Naida Demovic uh, of the University of Sarajevo, uh, Professor Rocco Zarnic, uh, who does not any, uh, he doesn't need any presentation, he is well known in the community of uh, 
uh, heritage structures and measuring structures uh, is from the University of Ljubljana. Uh, uh, Dr. Anastasios uh, Siavos uh, is from the ETH of Zurich. Uh, Dr. Anna Simoes, uh, who is a researcher and engineer, and she is also active as a, a reference person for uh, Tremuri in Portugal. Um, Mr. Papadopoulos, Georgios Papadopoulos, who was, is also a PhD student of the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, Dr. Jacopo Scacco, uh, Dr. Stiliano Scaglioras, and Mr. Marco Tondelli, that I well know more than the others as they were working with me in, in the past. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Scaglioras is a researcher at the European. Uh, uh, center, uh, joint research center in, in ISPRA, where, whereas Marco Tondelli is active as a consultant in the field of structure and seismic engineering by the, the company Stadata. Uh, sorry, Sismica 360. So, our next speaker is uh, actually Naida Demovic. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Naida Ademovic uh, and I'm an associate professor at uh, the University of Sarajevo Faculty of uh, Civil Engineering. And uh, today I will tell you something about uh, the assessment of masonry structures uh, after uh, 2020 earthquake in uh, Croatia. Uh, before I start uh, with uh, the presentation, I would like uh, to uh, devote uh, this uh, presentation uh, to uh, Dalibor Radonic, uh, who was uh, the owner and uh, the project manager of uh, Project uh, 2, a person who actually uh, gathered um, all of us uh, together uh, to work uh, uh, on the field of reconstruction and restoration of uh, existing buildings uh, after the earthquakes uh, that uh, hit uh, Croatia in uh, 2020. Uh, I do have to say uh, that on behalf of myself and all of my uh, colleagues that uh, we uh, are grateful uh, to Dalibor uh, and uh, we were proud that he actually chose us uh, to be a part of uh, his team. As uh, you can see in the map, uh, several uh, of uh, the companies are of course uh, from uh, Croatia. Uh, there are uh, two companies uh, from Italy and uh, one uh, company from and uh, Herzegovina. Uh, this is uh, the uh, composition uh, of our team uh, that uh, worked uh, on uh, the reconstruction and uh, rehabilitation of uh, the buildings uh, that were exposed uh, to uh, earthquake uh, activities uh, in uh, the year of uh, 2020 in Croatia, uh, basically in uh, Zagreb and uh, in uh, Petrinja. Uh, how we were actually doing uh, the things uh, we wanted uh, to uh, do our work uh, according to the latest technologies uh, and of course uh, application of uh, tools and uh, the idea is uh, that we produce uh, the um, the most uh, i would uh, say um, designs uh, of uh, the uh, of uh, the highest uh, qualities and uh, for this, um, in order uh, to do this, uh, we uh, used uh, 3D uh, scanning uh, software uh, because we wanted to, to uh, represent uh, the structure uh, as it is uh, on uh, one hand side. Uh, and what we are uh, very proud of uh, is uh, that for the modeling, for the structure modeling of uh, the structures, uh, we used uh, three uh, Modi uh, software, which we find uh, that is uh, one of uh, the best uh, softwares uh, for the uh, assessment uh, of uh, the existing uh, masonry structures. Uh, so basically, um, how we uh, did our work uh, is uh, in the sense uh, that, of course, uh, first of all, we wanted to, to gather as much as information regarding the structure. Uh, so uh, in this sense, uh, the uh, designs uh, from the archive uh, that we were able to gather, uh, we gathered this uh, information. Uh, the next step uh, was, of course, uh, the visual uh, inspection of uh, the structure. Uh, after the earthquake uh, and uh, in order to determine uh, the uh, level of uh, the damages uh, and of course uh, the type uh, of uh, the damages. Uh, the next step uh, was the production of the 3D uh, point uh, cloud uh, and the building uh, digital uh, model and uh, then uh, of course it was necessary to determine uh, the um, 
structural and non-structural components of uh, the buildings, uh, which was part of uh, the, uh, of course, uh, on-site uh, investigation. Uh, during the on-site uh, investigation, uh, we wanted to determine, of course, uh, the mechanical uh, characteristics uh, of uh, the material, because uh, this is one of the most important uh, elements uh, in the process, of course, uh, of uh, the modeling. So what we conducted, uh, we conducted the flat uh, jack uh, tests uh, and uh, ambient uh, vibration tests uh, in order to determine uh, the eigen uh, frequencies uh, and the uh, eigen uh, modes. Uh, of course, uh, in order to proceed uh, with uh, the recommendations of uh, the Eurocode, uh, first of all, we conducted uh, the verification of the vertical loads, and then we conducted uh, the model uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, in order uh, to see, uh, of course, uh, the behavior of uh, the structure, uh, then a uh, pushover analysis uh, was conducted in X and uh, Y uh, direction. Uh, the further step uh, was, of course, uh, the check of uh, the local uh, mechanism uh, verification. And uh, on the basis of uh, these uh, calculations, uh, of course, uh, then we decided if uh, there was a need uh, for strengthening uh, methods. Uh, uh, we uh, Every time uh, we suggested uh, several uh, strengthening uh, procedures. And of course, uh, then we conducted uh, the comparison of uh, these uh, scenarios, uh, these methods. And then uh, we decided uh, actually uh, which uh, strengthening method uh, was the best uh, for each uh, individual uh, we would say uh, case study uh, so uh, the case study that I'm going to, to show um, you uh, very briefly uh, is uh, a building uh, in uh, which is uh, located uh, in the street uh, Ribnak uh, 44 uh, in Zagreb and uh, what is uh, very interesting uh, for uh, this uh, structure is that uh, the structure was uh, constructed in uh, 1903 uh, but uh, as well it is important to state that from that period several reconstruction of uh, this uh, building uh, took place as uh, you can uh, see on uh, this um, uh, uh, on this uh, picture here it is actually uh, this uh, yellow uh, building. Uh, what is important to mention is that um, this building is located uh, in the uh, protection uh, in the area of uh, protection of cultural property of uh, Republika of uh, Croatia and uh, it is uh, actually in uh, zone uh, A of uh, the city uh, of uh, Zagreb. Uh, so the first uh, picture that you see, uh, you see actually uh, the uh, the street uh, facade and uh, on uh, the uh, others, uh, on the other uh, picture uh, you see uh, the structure which is uh, basically um, uh, from uh, the other, uh, from the other side and uh, what you can actually um, uh, notice is uh, that uh, there are some uh, reconstructions uh, that uh, took place uh, and uh, these are these uh, steel of course uh, steel columns uh, that uh, that uh, you can see on um, on the so, uh, first of all, um, uh, it was necessary to conduct uh, the laser scanning uh, and uh, detailed uh, inspection of uh, the site. So, from uh, this uh, figure, uh, you see uh, our Dalibor uh, doing uh, the uh, measurements and, of course, uh, the preparation uh, for uh, laser scanning uh, that was uh, conducted. Uh, the results of uh, the laser scanning uh, is, of course, uh, the building uh, digital uh, model, uh, which uh, you can see uh, in uh, this uh, picture. This was uh, very uh, important uh, because, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, there were several uh, reconstruction and changes uh, to the design of uh, the buildings. Uh, so we wanted to, to uh, exactly have uh, the right uh, geometry of uh, the building in order for our model uh, to be uh, as uh, real uh, as realistic as uh, the structure uh, is. So uh, the 3D vector digital model of uh, the existing uh, building uh, with uh, the cross uh, sections is uh, presented uh, in uh, this um, in uh, this slide. Uh, then, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, it was necessary uh, to gather, uh, of course, uh, all the information from the archives uh, that was uh, available on the left um, side of uh, the. Um, slide uh, you can uh, see uh, the uh, the original design uh, from uh, 1901 and at uh, the bottom uh, on uh, in red uh, color what is actually marked uh, is uh, the um, uh, the walls uh, that uh, were uh, demolished and on the right uh, hand uh, side uh, you have actually uh, the new walls and the new parts of uh, the structure uh, 
uh, were uh, constructed. Uh, what was as well uh, necessary is, uh, of course, uh, the, the, to determine uh, the material from uh, which uh, the structure was uh, constructed. As uh, we all know, uh, masonry uh, constructions uh, can be constructed of uh, various uh, masonry elements, uh, and uh, in this uh, specific uh, case, uh, these were uh, solid, uh, we would say, uh, solid uh, bricks uh, for uh, this um, uh, area. And what is as well very important is uh, the time of uh, construction of uh, the building, uh, because at that time uh, we can connect this, uh, of course, uh, with uh, the um, uh, valid uh, construction um, uh, technical uh, regulations. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, we know what uh, kind of uh, design uh, was uh, done at that uh, time. And uh, during uh, the uh, in situ investigation, uh, it was as well necessary uh, to determine the position and, uh, of course, uh, the distance uh, between uh, the timber uh, beams uh, that were uh, located uh, on, uh, that were actually creating a lab of uh, this uh, structure. Uh, the next uh, step uh, was a very uh, detailed uh, visual uh, inspection and the determ uh, determination of uh, the damage. Uh, this was uh, done uh, in a very uh, high uh, detail and uh, what we wanted to, to see is uh, of course uh, the direction of uh, the um, uh, of the cracks uh, so the pattern of the cracks uh, the width uh, of uh, the cracks uh, because this was very necessary in order that uh, when we actually uh, do the modeling of uh, the structure we wanted uh, to compare are we actually uh, through the modeling procedure are we actually going uh, to have a similar uh, damage uh, as the building uh, actually uh, experienced uh, this uh, damage after the earthquake uh, that uh, hit Zagreb in the year of uh, 2020. Uh, so on this uh, slide, uh, you can as well uh, see this is uh, the level of uh, the first uh, floor. Uh, you can uh, see, uh, of course, uh, the description of uh, the damages. And on the right-hand uh, side, uh, you can see the measurement, uh, of course, uh, of uh, the cracks uh, in uh, one of uh, the walls. And what is uh, very uh, interested is uh, that uh, these uh, were shear walls, uh, and uh, this was actually confirmed uh, in uh, the modeling uh, in uh, three moody uh, which is uh, presented uh, with uh, the picture on uh, the uh, on uh, at uh, the right hand uh, side of uh, the slide. Uh, following uh, this, um, as I already mentioned, uh, a, a very uh, detailed uh, inspection of uh, all uh, cracks uh, were uh, marked uh, on, uh, of course, uh, all, all uh, levels. And uh, this was uh, something uh, uh, which is very uh, important uh, in the sense uh, that um, this uh, structure was constructed in uh, 19 03 and uh, the slabs uh, were uh, basically uh, timber uh, slabs uh, made of timber which means that we are here dealing with uh, flexible uh, kind of uh, slabs uh, so uh, we would say that it was uh, quite uh, logical that uh, the cracks uh, that actually happen at the connection uh, of uh, the walls uh, and the cracks uh, between uh, the slab uh, and of course uh, the uh, structural uh, walls uh, these uh, is a typical kind of damage uh, for uh, this uh, kind of uh, structure. So we would uh, say this is something uh, which was more than uh, expected. Uh, the next step uh, we wanted uh, to uh, determine, uh, of course, uh, for the uh, verification and validation of uh, our model, we wanted uh, to determine uh, the characteristics uh, of uh, the material. Uh, so what we uh, conducted, uh, we conducted um, a single and uh, double uh, flat jack uh, test, uh, which uh, you can uh, see uh, on uh, this uh, slide, uh, in order to uh, determine, uh, of course, uh, the uh, compression, uh, compressive strength uh, of masonry on one hand side and on the other hand side uh, the modulus of uh, uh, elasticity so basically uh, what uh, you can see here is that the compressive strength uh, of masonry is 2.2 uh, uh, megapascal and the modulus of elasticity is only uh, 500 uh, megapascal. So uh, basically, we are uh, dealing here uh, with a very uh, low quality, uh, of course, uh, of uh, of course of masonry. Uh, in order uh, to um, uh, to determine uh, the um, eigen uh, frequencies and uh, eigen uh, modes, uh, of course, a, a dynamic uh, ambient uh, vibration uh, test um, uh, were uh, conducted, uh, and uh, based on uh, that, uh, we uh, obtained, of course, the value of our uh, frequencies uh, and uh, the 
shape modes, uh, which are uh, shown uh, in uh, the following slides. Uh, so as uh, you can uh, see, uh, the uh, first um, uh, eigenfrequency uh, was uh, 4.09 hertz, and uh, it was actually uh, bending uh, out of uh, out of plane uh, bending. And uh, basically, this is uh, something uh, that uh, actually happened uh, to uh, the building, uh, which was uh, seen. Uh, and uh, in uh, this uh, respect, uh, we can state uh, that, uh, of course, um, uh, this was something that uh, we had to take into account uh, during uh, our uh, modeling uh, modeling procedure. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, we uh, chose uh, three uh, MORI uh, to conduct uh, the uh, numerical uh, analysis uh, and uh, to actually conduct uh, the seismic uh, vulnerability uh, assessment. Uh, so, uh, you can uh, see uh, here the model, which was conducted in uh, three MORI. So, first of all, of course, as I already stated, we conducted uh, uh, the uh, model analysis uh, in order to uh, determine uh, the um, eigenfrequency. And uh, the eigenfrequency was very, uh, uh, very close uh, to the results uh, which uh, we obtained uh, from the on-site investigation and of course uh, this was uh, we would say uh, the first uh, thing uh, that uh, basically we uh, concluded uh, that our uh, model uh, was uh, done in our, uh, in a correct uh, way uh, then of course uh, we conducted the pushover analysis uh, in x and y uh, direction and what is important uh, to mention of course um, uh, we uh, took uh, into account uh, the pga of uh, the actual earthquake uh, that uh, hit uh, zagreb uh, in the year of uh, 2020 and uh, as you can uh, see, uh, of course, um, uh, there are uh, some of uh, the uh, elements uh, in the X uh, and uh, Y uh, direction, uh, of course, uh, which are in uh, red, meaning that uh, these um, these analyses uh, were uh, not uh, satisfied. Uh, so uh, the idea was, of course, uh, to conduct uh, some uh, kind of a strengthening, uh, some kind of a strengthening uh, procedure. So uh, once again, uh, here uh, you can uh, see uh, the pushover uh, analysis uh, in uh, X uh, and, of course, in uh, Y uh, direction, and then, uh, of course, uh, we that some kind of strengthening solution has to be conducted. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, uh, the idea uh, was uh, to uh, strengthen uh, the structure uh, with uh, steel frames uh, and uh, with um, FRCM uh, uh, on the ground floor uh, and uh, on the first uh, floor, uh, where uh, basically you can see uh, the plans uh, of uh, the ground floor and of course of uh, the first uh, floor, and uh, you can uh, see uh, down the characteristics uh, of the uh, FRCM uh, uh, that we used and uh, in uh, in the middle uh, you can uh, see uh, the, the steel frames uh, that uh, we actually uh, formed uh, in certain parts uh, of uh, the building uh, in order to strengthen, um, strengthen the structure. Uh, what is important to state here is that in this uh, situation, uh, what we wanted to uh, to do is uh, because we are uh, here talking uh, about. Um, uh, flexible, of course, about the flexible uh, slab. Uh, so, um, in order, uh, we decided uh, that our first uh, solution was actually uh, to strengthen um, the uh, slab uh, with uh, the overlapped uh, wooden uh, planks, uh, which uh, you can see uh, on the right, which you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, and of course, uh, you see the position of uh, the steel uh, frames, uh, which were uh, located in uh, certain uh, openings uh, and of course, uh, in certain uh, walls. Uh, of course, um, in the same sense, uh, the, um, uh, we conducted uh, the pushover uh, analysis in X uh, and uh, in uh, Y uh, direction. And uh, as uh, you can uh, see, after uh, conducting this kind of strengthening uh, procedure, uh, we uh, satisfied um, uh, uh, all uh, all the uh, calculations um, uh, had a satisfactory, uh, of course, uh, result. However, then we wanted uh, to try and uh, to see actually uh, what would be uh, the results uh, if we uh, changed a bit uh, the strengthening uh, method. And um, again, uh, as you can uh, see, uh, we uh, kept uh, the uh, FRCM uh, and uh, the steel uh, frames. However, we have eliminated uh, one of uh, the steel uh, frames uh, from uh, one of uh, the walls. Uh, 
And uh, what was interesting as well in this uh, situation, uh, we said, uh, okay, let us uh, in um, uh, let us actually uh, change uh, this lab and uh, use uh, the uh, concrete um, uh, concrete uh, topping, uh, even though um, we knew that uh, this was. Uh, not uh, and uh, this is something uh, that uh, should not should be in the sense of course um, uh, prevented uh, for the reconstruction of uh, the uh, existing uh, historical uh, buildings because uh, the best uh, issue uh, would be uh, of course uh, to strengthen uh, the structure with uh, the uh, wooden uh, planks and uh, to um, keep uh, the behavior uh, of uh, the structure um, exposed uh, to earthquake uh, action as it uh, uh, before. Uh, so uh, basically, of course, again, uh, we conducted uh, the analysis, uh, the pushover analysis uh, in X uh, and uh, Y uh, direction. And uh, what uh, you can see, of course, uh, in the lower uh, part uh, is uh, we wanted to, to uh, compare and uh, actually uh, to see uh, how was uh, the implication of uh, the strengthening uh, method uh, in relation uh, to the original, uh, to the original uh, structure. And by Comparing uh, these uh, two uh, elements, uh, we have uh, decided uh, that the first uh, solution uh, was uh, actually a better uh, solution, and uh, that was uh, our recommendation uh, for the uh, strengthening of uh, the structure. And uh, we need uh, to uh, state that uh, the strengthening of uh, the structure uh, was uh, conducted uh, for uh, the return period of uh, 19 uh, five uh, years. Uh, that is uh, for the level of uh, two. Uh, to the uh, creation uh, regulations. Uh, and uh, at uh, the moment, uh, there are uh, two projects uh, which are uh, being uh, done, uh, and uh, these are uh, the project uh, in uh, Frankopanska Street uh, and uh, Georgieva. <coughs> And uh, the model is uh, already uh, conducted uh, in uh, three uh, Mori, and uh, we will see uh, what would be uh, the next uh, step. Uh, this is uh, all from my side. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, attention. Uh, Professor Ritabento from the Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, this case study, the chapel from National Palace of Sintra. Um, um, and uh, the objective is to present an example of good practice in size and risk reduction, uh, and it comprises inspection uh, and diagnosis, structural analysis, safety assessment, and of course, the proposal of rehabilitation and string interventions. So these are basically uh, the common. Um, um, main steps for the seismic assessment and retrofitting of uh, this kind of structures. So we'll, the study starts with inspection and diagnosis, which is the step number one to a visual inspection complemented with in situ tests. Then the results were used for construction and calibration of reliable numerical models. So we are now in step number two, as well as for the, for the definition of rehabilitation actions. Then, after identify, identifying the most vulnerable parts, so we are now in step number three, some string techniques compatible with the building characteristics and other importance are suggested. Um, so, starting with the description of our um, of my case study. So, it is a chapel. It presents a classic um, cross plan shape composed of a nave, a transept, and a choir and a chancel. It was adapted along the years, and the main structural modification was the amplification of this area, the presbytery area. So, we have here the main dimensions of the chapel from the plan. Uh, plan side, but I'd like to highlight that the walls, the main three uh, walls, is about 11 meters high. So we have here some images of the interior of the wall. It contains mural paintings and a very delicate timber ceiling made of hardwood. Uh, the roof is um, of timber elements and they are supported on about 70 to 90 thick rubble stone masonry and with some stone works uh, at the corners of, of the chapel. You can see even that you have here um, a masonry arch which divides the space between the quarry and the chancel and it supports the ceiling and uh, of this later space, this later space. You can see that there are, from the beginning, there are some 
in fact two different you can see from the image one um, steel tie um, uh, roads in order that were introduced in order to somehow if avoid doubt of plan behavior of the of the walls uh, so looking now to the to the to the the type of roof and the timber structures that you have this figure presents the structural configuration of the two main timber trusses that were supporting the sailing and the roof of the nave so this is trust uh, a1 and we can see this type of trusses in the nave and transept but uh, in the choir and chancel you have the other type of truss, truss A3, with a different configuration, and it is introduced later on. It, it is not in the in the shuffle from the beginning. So the older trusses, as you can see here, the truss A1, are not self-supporting, and thus impose important horizontal out-of-plane forces to the structural walls of the chapel. And in this image, you can see, I think mainly from this image, you can see very well the out of plane behavior of the wall. In fact, we found from the laser scanning that the, the wall from the chapel has a maximum out of plane of about 30 centimeters. Um, in terms of inspection of diagnosis, you have performed different types of tests. In fact, we have two teams working in the chapel, uh, IST uh, from my university, so my team from University of Lisbon, and NECREP. NECREP is a private company, and for the, the chapel, it works together with the conservation and restoration team. So my team have done this type of, of uh, tests um, uh, for the geometric characterization, uh, laser scanning, and uh, we have also the support in the UAV. We have performed ground penetration hazard, hazard tests, um, masonry samples collection, flat check tests, and then the vibration tests. And the inspection, uh, the CREP have been working uh, with the timber structural elements characterization and the study of the roof. And uh, um, uh, the work uh, then uh, included the opening of survey windows from the outside, as you can see here, but also from the inside of the chapel. Um, so the geometrical survey, as I mentioned, uh, of the entire chapel was performed using the equipment our equipment and uh, uh, the laser scanner survey uh, was a, uh, with this what was possible to get a very impressive uh, very important 3d definition of the geometry of the structure and as an example we have here in the right side uh, the accurate geometry that you can obtain uh, with these and for the definition of the geometric model was very important. Just, just see, for instance, the wall, which is the connection between the chapel and the kitchen, it has a thickness which varies um, along the width, and this was only possible to get with this type of uh, survey. So, with the point cloud data set, we also um, uh, de developed a HV model where we include all the information that you obtain for the chapel, not only from the inspection, but also from the numerical studies. And with this, uh, we can very easily get uh, some horizontal sections and trans vertical uh, sections that, uh, of course, they will be very useful, mainly in future interventions of uh, the, the, the chapel. So some very briefly, some types of results that you obtain for, with our uh, types of tests. So GPR, it was very important for in the chapel for characterization of the type of measure uh, that we have. Um, the, the, the sample connection uh, identified by S in this three, uh, 3D representation uh, allows us to know that we have a significant percentage of voids in our masonry of our chapel. Um, the flat check te uh, test identified by F allows us to understand the, from the inspection uh, window 
the quality of the of the mortar, but to, to estimate some of the characteristics important for characterization of the masonry, and of course the ambient vibration tests was were crucial for the, then for the numerical calibration. Uh, for this facade, the, the sensors location of the sensor identified with this circle, red circles, and just to represent, we have here the first mode of vibration, transversal mode, as expected of of the chapel. Uh, this is the type of work that had been developed for the characterization of the timber structure. So it was used non-destructive equipment, as you can see from these images. And it was possible to conclude that uh, uh, the major damage on the timber elements were related to the termite attacks. And the identification of the type and location of these attacks was fundamental for the definition of the final retrofitting of the sail and the roof. So moving now to the seismic performance assessment. Uh, it was developed with Remuri, of course, in which the in-plan and out-plan behavior were studied through the nonlinear analysis. So the chapel is this um, uh, structure in the middle. Uh, it has to be important that it was uh, very important to account for the boundary conditions of this uh, of this uh, case study. In fact, the calibration of the model based on dynamic characteristics identified within C2 ambient vibration tests was one of the most difficult tasks that uh, you have to go through for the seismic assessment of the chapel. In particular, because to obtain the correct dynamic characteristics, it was necessary to model the uh, the total buildings, adjacent buildings. So we start with some parts of the adjacent buildings, but it was not possible to accomplish the dynamic characterizations that we had obtained in situ. So it was really uh, challenging to, to get the final numerical modeling. Uh, here we have the pushover curves that have been obtained until the ultimate displacement of the chapel, it is worth noting that in this case, as it was necessary to model the entire Bonnet building, Bonnet building was the building on the left hand side, you can see here from the plan view, to get the, the correct dynamic characteristics, you have to model the, 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 the total uh, side buildings. Um, and as this building was uh, is much more vulnerable than the chapel, the ultimate displacement of these pushover curves do not correspond to the typical 20% decay because uh, whenever the first critical element of the chapel occur, and you can this way to consider that you have reached the collapse, uh, the bonnet building, the other building was completely um, already uh, with a significant uh, uh, number of elements that have already collapsed. Um, so for this longitudinal direction, it was very important the effect of the other buildings for transversal direction. It was not like this, of course. And you can see that you have um, for the y direction, uh, completely different behavior with much lower values of the maximum capacity in terms of shear, uh, maximum uh, resistance, and uh, much smaller uh, capacity uh, of the formation of our structure. Just an example of the type of damage that we have obtained in the two main directions. It was uh, basically very clear from here that only some uh, specific vertical elements will have collapsed uh, on, uh, on the chapel whenever the, 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 the other have been completely collapsed as well. So after having performing um, and obtained these pushover curves, uh, the, sa the safety assessment uh, of the implant behavior of the chapel was carried out uh, following the recommendations of part one and part three of Euro code eight, and of course the Portuguese national annex. And we realized that the safety was not satisfied in terms of the global behavior of the chapel. For the out of plan behavior, we have considered nonlinear kinematic analysis and, and uh, um, performed using uh, according to the macro block modeling approach. And of course, we have used, as you can see from these images, a tool in the Tremuri program. Uh, 
uh, year it is represent all the mechanisms that you have studied. So a total of eight different mechanisms were studied for this for this case study. So based on these results, some different rehabilitation and string intervention have been proposed for the chapel. So for the sailing and the hoof structures, and um, uh, you have considered different types of, uh, of solutions. So try to apply insecticide or fungicide in the timber uh, structures who have been attacked by these termites. We have considered also some new structures disconnect from the existing one in order to improve the behavior of the hoof. Uh, and uh, it was includes some uh, OSB boards in order to increase the inclined stiffness um, of, these, uh, of these structures and new connections between the hoof structures and the masonry walls. Of course, these are rather important also to improve the local behavior of the chapel. For the global, be global behavior, and in order to increase the strength and formation capacity uh, of the walls, we have proposed ground injection with mortar. Of course, it has to be compatible with the original one. And in some of the walls, to apply also uh, reinforced plaster, FRP meshes, of course, only from the outside of the walls due to the, the very rich interior of the chapel and these uh, on the most vulnerable walls. For local behavior, despite to improve the connections between the hoof and the masonry, some new steel ties were also proposed. So let's start very briefly with the, the intervention uh, of the hoof structure. So considering the current state of, of conservation and the structural safety assessment, it was possible to conclude that the local strength of the existing elements and the, the replacement of the damaged ones um, was too intrusive uh, and extremely difficult to apply on site. So what it was proposed is to have some new traces identified in orange here in, in this plan view, along with the existing ones. Uh, and this is the configuration of the new um, traces that have been proposed for this retrofitting. You can see also that these new traces, how they are connected with the masonry, with this UNP steel profile in order to improve the connection with the masonry walls. Um, so here we have the identification of some of the walls that uh, it was proposed to to, to retrofit it uh, with, uh, and you have the, these two blue colors. Uh, so this uh, blue identified the walls where it is proposed only the ground injection and the others more dark with ground injection and um, uh, FRP meshes. Uh, and with this, it was possible to fulfill the, the, the seismic assessment. But of course, to have some reliable numerical model with this uh, retrofitting uh, mastery walls, it was necessary to somehow uh, understand how these solutions will improve the, 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 the strain capacity and the, the, the formation capacity of the wall. So we have no, no information about that, so we decided to do some laboratory tests uh, for different types of retrofitting, only with ground injection, with ground injection and different types of meshes or only meshes. And we, will, we managed to obtain the results that any of you have used in our numerical modeling. So the results of this laboratory test, the first one, let's say the preliminary ones have been already published in this publication. And uh, we, we hope very soon to have an, uh, another publication with much more results of, of this study. So here we have a comparison in, in, this, uh, in this slide, uh, the string solid lines and non-string, which are the dashed lines models, which are compared uh, in the transversal direction. So here, Y direction, um, uh, we have a greater difference when compared to the other direction. So we can see that you have significant improve the, the string capacity, but also the, the formation capacity 
uh, for the, the, the chapel with this uh, solution and with this we managed to uh, guarantee the safety of, of the chapel. In terms of out-of-plane behavior, basically what was proposed is to confirm in situ the proper work of functioning of the existing tie roads, T1 and T2, and to have two more tie roads in order to avoid the out-of-plane behavior of some of the masonry walls of the of the chapel and basically that's all just to highlight the importance in these studies the importance of the first step related inspection and diagnosis activities crucial uh, for the, uh, the the calibration of our numerical models and these together with the circle safety assessment are the only way where you can identify the most vulnerable parts of our uh, structure and then to propose um, the rehabilitation and the string intervention. This last paragraph basically is a summary of the type of interventions that uh, I mentioned previously. And that's all. Thank you so much. I hope that this time you have listened until the end. Yes, yeah, true. Uh, and uh, really thank you, Professor Bento, for uh, this uh, really interesting uh, and uh, comprehensive uh, case study. The, the, the case study is a really uh, a special one. I mean, it is a very unique uh, case study, but also the, the work you have presented is really uh, comprehensive and somehow uh, it is really a summary of what we should do every time when we can. I mean, in this case, you, in this case, you have a special case and uh, probably special means as well uh, to, for this. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm really sorry for these technical problems. Many software, many systems and confusion. So, uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, some of you know me, some not, but anyway, I am now, uh, how to say, retired research active person. Uh, so I'm not teaching anymore, but now I'm doing uh, what I like. And I was also asked, engaged by one company uh, from Zagreb, Planetaris, to help them in assessment of some cultural heritage. Uh, what I'm going to present to you is some project which is in a relatively early stage. So please do not expect uh, so fantastic data we listened in previous two, but I will more uh, talk about my impression how with the complex uh, monuments we can have problems, what we can need, how Tremuri can help us. So I'm talking about a monumental building uh, designed by Herman Bollet, known architect who designed the monumental um, uh, cemetery in Zagreb and this uh, building I'm talking about, next slide please, uh, is the building uh, which is actually mortuary, you'll see, but uh, quite uh, sad kind of building, but very interesting as a structural one. So I will give a little bit uh, insight and history of structural alternations because from its uh, erection 1886, 86, it was alternated uh, regarding to some historic needs. And what made the changes in structural properties. Then I will talk a little bit of challenges of Srimuri modeling regarding this rather complex structural uh, characteristic of building. I have a little suggestions for minor Srimuri upgrading, which may be already, but I didn't find it. And I have also some suggestions about the three new Srimuri structure elements made based on my personal research history and my colleagues uh, working on that. Next, please. So uh, everybody knows that uh, Zagreb is very earthquake prone area. AG for 475 years is 0.26, what is underestimated, everybody agrees. And this area was hit by two strong earthquakes in last 140 years. Uh, 6.3 ml um, with epicenter in Zagreb was on 9 
uh, November 88. The building we are talking about today is something that was constructed after that earthquake. What we can see in original design, the well-known truth that if buildings were designed or constructed with quite amount of money in the time, uh, they were very well constructed. My own experiences from Ljubljana, Slovenia, is that the best masonry buildings are from the late Austro-Hungarian period or the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century. And we can consider this building in the same category. Also, the architect and the builders had very good experiences gained from the recent earthquake, which was just two years uh, before erecting this building. And so the last earthquake in Zagreb, uh, 2020, again affected this building, but uh, no visual damages outside were recorded, neither inside very slight. I'm going to talk about that. Please, next slide. So that is just to get an idea, a layout of this building with the cross sections. Well, it's uh, just to get one impression, very monumental one. Please, next slide. And these are these typical internal cracks, which we can say slight to moderate on very expected places. There are some parts of building which were uh, some openings or doors closed. And what is very known is nothing to talk about. And it's uh, on the upper part of the lintels of uh, windows, so nothing dramatic. Next, please. Next, please. OK. And um, OK, we have also the um, uh, digital uh, survey of this building, but uh, very, very good documentation from original building, 8086 documentation, and also design of enlargement in 1913 were available. And also the last, 1993, which was very radical strengthening, by uh, putting in the reinforced concrete uh, slabs uh, were available and very, very good architectural drawings. So we could make a model just based on this data. Next. Next, please. OK, uh, if we uh, uh, if just to. Uh, here you can see in cross section what happened uh, in uh, years, the originally uh, floors of the uh, 1886 and 1913 were uh, single direction timber structures with all these layers as usual. But on 1993, designers of strengthening decide to put reinforced concrete structure above it, just leaving the floors because the investor didn't want to damage the floors because there are some paintings, some decorations. So it's actually new building, new uh, floor system atop the old uh, floor system. So that is something what was the first question in modeling of, uh, of this building. Uh, so until now, I don't really have answer. I just used for the current state the main uh, reinforced concrete structure and the lower one just as a mass attached. Why? Because the uh, direction of the new slabs are in perpendicular direction than the old one. So uh, it would be maybe for Tremuri a future challenge to see how to make a double floor possible, or if somebody knows how to do, I would be very grateful. Next, please. So these are, this I, I just made a little bit uh, a model is ready so that you get a little bit impression. And that is the model of the original building, 1886. So uh, the next, please. The next. And in um, 
after the First World War, they added the part which you see in different color, and that is today's current situation with uh, reinforced concrete slabs and beams. But also, uh, uh, um, we are going to make intermediate uh, system analysis where only where the configuration of walls is a sphere, but with only wooden floors. So we'll have actually three uh, models plus one from 1934, where they removed some walls and then added again. So it's quite an uh, interesting game to play with. Next one. Uh, currently, uh, I cannot show you uh, the results because the site investigations are in progress. But from the first uh, information, um, the masonry used in 8086 was far more far with far higher quality than the one in the adding uh, 60 30 40 years later that's why i didn't want to make any any uh, calculation yet because there's such a big difference is you have to find it and then uh, next time i hope i can deliver you more information but okay uh, what uh, we learned from this? Some challenges. Well, modeling of unusual structural compositions, a two ply, I call it two ply floor, I don't know, two level floor, uh, with alternate direction of load bearing beams, it's for me, I don't know how to cope with. Uh, I had also a little bit problem with modeling of columns. I must say that I'm not very experienced user. My peer students were much more experienced, uh, so maybe I will ask some of them. I am trying to do something because I have time now myself and we'll see how it will go on. And also I found that the, from my side, who am an early user, the online help support is quiet, in some cases weak, especially when I want to integrate the roof structure frames, they come some diagnosis, which is not very clear, although I follow completely the, the manual. Also, quiet week online help support is for issues uh, uh, found out from model analysis and kinematic analysis. So uh, uh, I will dig in more and try to resolve, but it could be a little bit more work on these issues. Next one. So uh, maybe. Uh, on side of help uh, to be a little bit more improved. Uh, also, it would be good to slightly add something else because uh, very oftenly the timber floors are like it's here on this drawing. The double plank and planks are one inch. So, and I think it can it can contribute can contribute. So it's very easy for. Uh, designers of the to put in it's a little thing but then i have two other suggestions well uh, i was work i'm i was working about 15 years on the clt testing and also in one system which uh, we developed together with university of zagreb clt frame with the laminate the glass which is very much load bearing element so maybe next slide uh, these two systems could be very well used, especially very, when you need to replace the inner partition walls and you are limited in dimension. Why? We found out that CLT, 3 ply CLT of typical 10 centimeters, have load bearing capacity of the quite good masonry wall of 30 or even more centimeters. Technically, it's very easy. And if needed, uh, I have quite a lot of data of we did testing 15 years on this. So here in this reference, there are some things referred. So I would be happy if we can work on this. And also the recent one uh, is published uh, last year, uh, year 2020. It's this element which can be very useful when we need to open uh, some part in facade, but to be load bearing. So since all envelopes and, uh, and uh, historical curves are very similar to those of masonry, 
but with much, much higher ductility, I think it can be maybe worthwhile to think about this initiative. I was talking with Sergio Lagomarsino because we've been together in one of projects, new projects, uh, Perpetuate. Uh, he said that he will come to me with this. I'm waiting for him. And maybe it could be, uh, could be especially in Zagreb, there are many buildings in the city center where partition walls are damaged. People are not happy to have some structural thing from the basement up, but they could accept something like the CLT. So maybe in future it can be a challenge. Next, please. So let me thank you for attention. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't deliver you more information, but just something about the project in progress. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Professor Zarnic. The, your presentation was really interesting, and finally we got it uh, complete. And uh, uh, I also thank you for, uh, for all the suggestions you gave. Part of them are uh, relatively, say, easy to implement, and say the the definition of equivalent floor for the CLT double plank uh, floor could be uh, could, could could be implemented easily as a user defined um, floor, whereas the the addition of a new element for uh, for uh, the CLT framed and laminated glass uh, uh, element uh, needs some uh, further development, although it is quite uh, uh, compatible with those with the with the elements which are already implemented in the program. So I, I think this is something that could be implemented in the future. In particular, if uh, as you say, this could be of help for uh, uh, specific projects for, for for specific applications. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. And I, I now pass the. Uh, speech to Dr. Anna Simoes the, the, from Lisbon, and uh, she, she is, uh, as I told you, a researcher, but she also works as a um, Termuri representative in, uh, in, in Portugal. So please, Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my screen we can, now. We, we can, we can. Oh, good. Thank you. So thank you very much for the introduction and um, also to Sadata for the organization of this seminar. Um, so my presentation has uh, this title, Seismic Vulnerability Assessment of Masonry Buildings in Portugal. Okay, no. And uh, so the, this is the outline. I'm going to briefly talk about the seismic risk in Portugal, about the regulation in force right now in Portugal as well. And I'm going to present some case studies of uh, masonry buildings um, analyzed using Tremuri um, and uh, that are being, uh, as well as some work developed um, in different universities in Portugal using Tremuri as well. So when we uh, combine uh, Portugal and earthquakes, one of the, the first uh, ideas that come to our mind is the 1755 uh, Lisbon earthquake, of course. Uh, so uh, because it's completely destroyed the city of Lisbon, uh, not only because of the earthquake itself, but because of the tsunami and the fire that uh, uh, spread it through the city uh, just afterwards. Um, so when we talk about seismic risk in Portugal or in other, uh, any other location, we have to consider these three components, of course, so the, the seismic hazard, the exposure and the vulnerability. So here uh, on the left side, I have a, a picture of the, the main tectonic faults in Portugal mainland. So Portugal is located in the southwest part of the Eurasian plate near the border with the African plate and the North American plate. We are subjected to uh, offshore seismic events and onshore seismic events. Uh, in terms of exposure, uh, this relates to the, um, to the buildings, infrastructures and people exposed to these 
hazard. So here we have the um, uh, view from Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, and finally vulnerability. So here I decided to 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 put this picture from uh, Carmo Convent in Lisbon. This uh, convent was destroyed after the 1755 earthquake, and um, it was decided a few years after to to keep it as it is as a memorial. Uh, of the earthquake and the damage that it caused in Lisbon. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about some of the most important seismic events in Portugal. So again, the 1755 earthquake in Lisbon that also affected the south area of Portugal, the area of Algarve, as well as the north of Africa. And uh, this um, seismic event uh, was uh, is considered as reference for the definition of the um, offshore um, um, seismic event according to our regulation. Also, another event, the 1909 uh, earthquake in Benevente, which is a town not so far away from Lisbon, and this uh, uh, event is considered as reference as well for the definition of uh, the uh, onshore seismic event according to our regulation. Another major event, not so many years ago, so the 1969 earthquake that uh, um, affected uh, Portugal a little bit from north to south, mainly in the, in the countryside area. And of course, uh, talking about uh, earthquakes in Portugal, we have to also um, emphasize the earthquakes uh, that happened in Azores the one in 1980 uh, in Terceira Island, and the, this one in 1998 in Fayal and Pico Island, with many damages on masonry buildings. And finally, I could not finish this, this part without referring this series of seismic events that uh, uh, are happening in Azores right now, uh, since March until now, more or less, uh, so many seismic events, some of them felt by the population. There was also the threat of a volcanic eruption. Uh, in terms of damage, uh, there is not a lot of, uh, the, the records are not significant, but okay, it's just part of the, our daily news right now, even though things are much more calmer uh, at this moment. Um, so, um, Talking about uh, Portugal, mainland Portugal, again, there are many studies that were developed uh, to assess the seismic risk of the building stock in Portugal. Um, this study from Silva, um, they all developed in 2015. Uh, so there were some estimations of what yeah. would be the direct economic losses uh, if uh, an earthquake uh, with a return period of 475 years would have. So it was estimated that um, the direct, only direct economic losses would be um, about 32% of the GDP from Portugal uh, dating from 2011. Uh, it was highlighted as well that the main critical areas were the region of Lisbon uh, and the south of um, Portugal in the area of Algarve. Uh, and that uh, the critical classes or typologies of buildings would be the masonry buildings. Um, it's also important to refer that uh, more than half of the um, building stock in Portugal is composed by masonry buildings. Okay, so this is the the global picture of the um, seismic hazard and seismic uh, risk that we have in Portugal. Now, in terms of regulation. Um, the first regulation in Portugal uh, that um, referred the need to consider the seismic action for the design of buildings dates back from 1958. So uh, at the time in a very simplified way. There were some revisions in 1961 and uh, after in 1983 uh, with a more sophisticated um, uh, way to, to, to define or um, more accurate way to define the seismic action and also the analysis methods. And uh, this uh, regulation from 1983 is still uh, uh, in use until uh, these days. However, in 2019, 
uh, we finally um, approved the, the application of the euro codes in Portugal as the design uh, regulations for the design and the assessment of buildings. So we are still in the transition period between the uh, application of both uh, regulations, uh, but this uh, period is going to end now in September. So, but the point here is that uh, until now, or uh, before uh, 2019, there was no legal requirements for the assessment of existing buildings in Portugal. And uh, we have uh, some uh, special uh, regulation for um, uh, conservation uh, works and rehabilitation works in existing buildings. Uh, but uh, uh, even that regulation, there was no consideration um, uh, regarding the seismic uh, safety of these buildings. So this is the, the scenario that we have in Portugal uh, at the moment. So um, this, um, uh, after 2019 and 2020, um, uh, Stadata had a a bigger representation in Portugal with uh, the, the commercial collaboration um, um, with the, the commercial representation of Tremuri program made by me and uh, in collaboration with Professor Rita Bento from Instituto Superior Técnico. Um, and um, also because of the implementation of the Euro codes um, as the, the, the codes in force in Portugal, a lot of uh, training courses and seminars uh, started to 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 be uh, presented in Portugal, um, exactly to uh, transfer the knowledge that uh, for many many years has been developed inside the universities, but to transfer this knowledge for the industry, uh, so the the awareness uh, start to increase. Um, we can also refer that the work that I, we have been done. Uh, together, um, have been doing together with the um, National Organization for Engineers and the National Organization for Technical Engineers, as well the training courses uh, developed and promoted by Fundec, the um, the Advanced uh, Training Association from Instituto Superior Técnico, and I'm also happy to to say that the Tremuri is uh, right now being used in many, many universities from north to south in Portugal um, that uh, they are highlighted here in this map. Um, so Tremuri is being used in terms of uh, PhD and master thesis research works, final reports uh, from uh, courses, also uh, some publications in terms of national, international journals and conference proceedings. So uh, Tremuri is being used as a um, a tool for the seismic assessment of um, existing buildings and especially masonry buildings, of course. So I'm going to present now uh, some case studies um, that uh, have been developed in the last years using Tremuri, um, the work that has been developed in the Instituto Superior Técnico. So I'm going to start um, with the, showing this work that was developed by Elena Mareos in her uh, PhD research work uh, that uh, addresses the, the seismic behavior of Pombalino buildings in Lisbon. So Pombalino buildings are masonry buildings that were um, uh, built in Lisbon after the, the 1755 earthquake. So these buildings, they have these uh, uh, specific features that uh, um, um, that uh, uh, characterize their better behavior in terms of seismic action, or at least they were uh, designed with some um, uh, um, seismic measures um, uh, in mind. Uh, for example, we have these uh, characteristic interior walls that are defined by a truss timber structure that was then infilled with masonry. Uh, and during uh, uh, the, the PhD work, uh, uh, a very significant experimental campaign was um, developed exactly to characterize the behavior of this type of walls. And uh, um, it was also developed um, a macro element model 
uh, for the modeling of this type of falls in Tremuri, but in the research version of Tremuri. So this was then uh, used for the global uh, model and analysis of uh, this uh, Pombalino building that was uh, uh, took as reference, let's say. What I can refer now is that we are at the moment developing some work um, in order to um, define which parameters can be considered for the modeling of this type of walls, uh, these Pombalino frontal walls, um, but using uh, Tremuri in the commercial version. So we are uh, calibrating uh, and um, um, uh, the parameters based on the experimental work, the experimental results, and we are going to publish these results um, in the end of this year for this conference that will be held in UNEC in uh, Lisbon. So something to, to watch. Um, uh, another case study um, is the, um, the, the work that I developed during my research work for my PhD thesis. Uh, together with Professor Rita Ben, Professor Sergio Lago Marcino, and Professor Serena Catri, and Professor Paulo Lorenzo. So, um, well, this uh, this work addressed the seismic behavior of Galeiro buildings as well in Lisbon. Uh, so, these uh, buildings were built after the Pombalino uh, period of uh, construction. And uh, the, these buildings have, um, in general, a worse behavior in terms of uh, seismic performance. Um, and um, so that's why we, we found it was important to address them and see uh, effectively the, their behavior. Um, uh, a lot of work was done in terms of the, the global uh, behavior of the buildings, also using Tremuri, the local behavior uh, of the walls. Also, in terms of uh, uh, analysis of uncertainties, aleatory, epistemic. So, the, the final aim was the definition of uh, fragility curves for this specific typology of buildings. Um, another work that I'm also uh, happy to present is the work uh, um, done by Yelena Milosevic, also for her PhD thesis. Uh, related with the um, uh, assessment of mixed masonry reinforced concrete buildings in Lisbon. So these buildings uh, preceded the, the reinforced concrete uh, structures. Um, and uh, again, here, uh, Tremuri was used for the modeling and assessment of different uh, prototypes of buildings that are representative of this uh, typology. Uh, also, uh, the, some uncertainties were addressed. And uh, finally, the fragility curves representative of these buildings were derived. Um, so more work than with Tremuri and Institute Superior Technique. So we have again uh, this, uh, I have here a picture of the National Palace of Sintra, the, the work that Professor Rita Viento just presented. Um, and uh, I would also like to, to refer that right now, there are some studies that are also uh, undergoing uh, regarding Montserrat Palace in Sintra, uh, also using Tremuri for its assessment uh, in terms of uh, seismic vulnerability. Okay. Now, I would also like to bring uh, case studies from other universities. I know that I'm already on top of the time, but uh, um, I would like to highlight this work developed at the University of Aveiro. Um, this work uh, was um, addressed the seismic uh, assessment of um, masonry buildings in, in Faro, a city from the south of Portugal, also with a high seismic hazard and seismic risk. Um, so uh, this, uh, this work is very interesting because it addresses um, the, the behavior of the masonry buildings but uh, considering the, the effect of the aggregate. So it's one of the, uh, let's say, research gaps <laughs> or um, a topic that is uh, under a lot of uh, um, uh, development right now to see how to tackle this, uh, this type of issue. So it's a, a work that uh, it's very interesting. And um, again, it was developed with Tremuri.
Um, another case study also from University of Aveiro, uh, this um, uh, regarding the assessment of masonry buildings in Azores Islands, so two different prototypes uh, of buildings, also representative of the buildings in uh, Fayal Island. So uh, a huge characterization was done and also some uh, strengthening techniques were uh, addressed and uh, evaluated uh, to see their uh, effectiveness. So, um, well, I'm going to, to conclude. So the idea with this presentation was exactly to, to bring an overview of the seismic vulnerability um, assessment of uh, buildings in Portugal and also uh, the research work that has been done uh, in the academia um, in the last years. There's a lot of uh, information available and uh, can be used as a reference by the industry uh, when, uh, when dealing with this type of um, problems. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shimash. Your presentation was really interesting also because you show a, a set of different case studies, different types of measure, different application also in terms of reinforcement. I mean, uh, the, the strengthening techniques you have presented are really interesting and also the, see the, the, the versatility, the, the capacity of Tremori to, to be, uh, let's say, uh, suitable for for different type of uh, of masonry structures and uh, mixed structures together with masonry timber and and concrete this is really very interesting and also together with the previous presentation it, it helps in understanding the the capabilities that uh, uh, through the years have been developed in within the, uh, the commercial version of the program and in in the research version of the program. research version the program needs to be a few years ahead with respect to what is implemented in the in the commercial this is necessarily this way and uh, uh, but, but then it works so that the things that are already developed and tested in the research version then now come into the into the commercial one thanks again uh, i now leave the floor to dr Anastasio siavos uh, is Greek, but he's uh, speaking from Switzerland. <laughs> and Dr. Siavos is lecturer at the ETH in Zurich, and uh, he's going to present a talk uh, with title uh, Synergetic Design Assessment and Retrofitting Approach for Sustainable and Resilient Communities. Please, Anastasius. So thank you very much for this uh, honor of uh, inviting me in this very interesting uh, session. Um, are you all able to see my screen? We see. So you can see my... my... Yeah, 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 we can see everything. Okay. So thank you very much, Professor Pena, for this invitation and uh, Stardata. So uh, good afternoon from Zurich here at ETH. Uh, the topic of my today's presentation is going to be about the synergetic design, assessment, and retrofitting approaches for sustainable and resilient communities. So actually, uh, a little bit about my position. I'm a lecturer at ETH Zurich. I'm teaching the, the courses Seismic Evaluation and Retrofitting of Existing Buildings and Seismic Design and Evaluation of Bridges. I'm a program coordinator of a new CAS program in Seismic Evaluation and Retrofitting at uh, ETH Zurich. So a little bit about my research interests. Um, one, uh, basically they are based on five pillars. The first one is about the sustainable and low cost seismic design strategies. The second is about the synergetic assessment methods for existing structures. The third one is about the sustainable and synergetic seismic retrofitting methods. And um, uh, I investigate these three topics uh, based on numerical methodologies, numerical approaches and uh, a large-scale experimental investigation. So uh, one part of my research focuses on seismic isolation of structures. Basically, one problem there is that the high installation cost and the resource demanding construction process uh, basically um, inhibit the application of the existing seismic isolation methods to a wide range of countries and buildings worldwide. Therefore, the question there is, could we reduce this cost by using low-cost seismic isolation methods that use only materials 
that are locally available or can be easily resourced. And based on that, uh, during my research at the University of Bristol, uh, we developed a, a, a new uh, low-cost seismic isolation strategy that is called PVC sandwich. It's uh, basically based on a, a very thin layer of sand that is uh, sandwiched between two PVC layers. And this configuration, this encapsulation of very uh, a thin layer of sand particles cre creates a, a rolling behavior of the, uh, of the sand particles. And basically, um, um, this rolling behavior leads to an attractively low friction coefficient that basically enables structures to slide at an uh, approximately uh, uh, seismic intensity acceleration a little bit lower than 0.2 g. And you see here the relative, relevant experiments at the University uh, of uh, Bristol. And basically, a little bit about this isolation. Um, basically, you see we, we tested a, a steel structure first on the 3 by 3 shaking table of the University of Bristol. And you see that when the uh, friction coefficient is exceeded by the seismic intensity of the ground motion record, what we can observe is a, a substantial sliding of the structure with respect uh, to the, the bottom uh, due to the rolling behavior of the sand uh, grains. We continue that, uh, that, that research, we expanded it to uh, masonry structures and basically what we developed there is a low cost uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid seismic design solution, which basically is based on the activation of different seismic response mechanisms for different seismic hazard uh, levels that our structures are exposed to. Basically, uh, what we, we, we propose there is to um, uh, uh, protect the existing masonry building uh, for the design hazard level using um, a steel ties or a steel wire mesh um, that basically prevent the out of plane failure, increase the, the strength capacity of the structure. And then for motions that exceed the seismic design hazard level, uh, what we propose is the sliding fuse mechanism, a second uh, response mechanism that is basically enables this sliding of the bottom of the structure with respect to the the, the foundation uh, uh, due to this uh, sand sandwich sand layer. And this combined mechanism leads to a seismic protection strategy for various uh, seismic design hazard levels. And you see the application of this technique in an existing masonry structure, the attachment of the steel mesh that should be attached to the bottom and the top of the, the masonry wall, um, the steel ties, and uh, basically the test that we did on the masonry structure, you see here uh, uh, a large scale test at the University of Bristol and the response that is basically for high amplitude of accelerations is basically uh, uh, a sliding response due to this uh, rolling behavior of the sand uh, grains. But apart from that, a very uh, um, a major part of my, my current research focuses on the synergetic assessment and retrofitting strategies for existing uh, buildings. So what is the motivation behind this work that many buildings in Europe and worldwide do not combine, comply with modern code provisions and are, uh, seismic code provisions that are at the same time energy deficient? Uh, the case is that the investment required for the retrofitting of these buildings cannot be easily justified in many cases based on the benefit obtained through the seismic risk reduction of the, these buildings. And uh, several uh, seismic design and retrofit solutions are characterized by substantial cost and high carbon emissions. So what we, we think is that there is a need for a holistic and synergetic approach in the design, assessment and retrofitting of structures considering their seismic behavior, their energy performance, and their carbon footprint. So what we proposed is a first a, a holistic um, assessment tool that basically uh, categorizes the behavior of uh, the structure in uh, three different aspects. The first one is the, what is called the compliance factor is currently implemented in the Swiss code provisions for the assessment of existing buildings. And it's basically, it's a ratio of the seismic capacity of an existing structure over the seismic demand that would be needed for the design of a new structure in the same location. 
So basically we talk usually when we deal with existing structure, we talk about values of this ratio lower than one. And uh, based on these values, we can categorize the, the behavior of the building in uh, several uh, classes that you see over here. This is one aspect of our assessment tool. Uh, the second aspect is the energy performance of the existing structure. There we divide the U value of an existing structure uh, through the U value for a new structure. And basically what we propose is a, a similar categorization uh, with respect to the corresponding energy performance of a new structure. And we can see uh, how uh, our structure compares with respect to the U value and the heating demand of the structure. The last pillar of this assessment tool is the embodied carbon emissions uh, of the of the basically the retrofitting or the assessment technique uh, where we can assess uh, how uh, what is the environmental impact of our uh, retrofitting with respect to the CO2 equivalent per uh, square meter. According to these classes, we can uh, show illustrate the energy behavior of the building uh, at the current state. At the, uh, after also the implementation of a synergetic retrofitting strategy that you see with the, uh, the gray line and also after a low carbon synergetic retrofitting strategy in which this spider gram shows good behavior in, in uh, three aspects at the same time. High rating in seismic behavior, high rating in carbon footprint, high rating in energy performance. This is our goal to increase the behavior of, of the structure, not only in one aspect, but at three uh, aspects at the same time. So what we try to do is uh, simulate the uh, behavior of a URM, uh, unreinforced masonry case study building in Switzerland, um, uh, located in Sion with the highest seismicity. And you see the building over here, Basically, uh, it is a, um, a building that is seismically vulnerable uh, based on a, a three-story building with uh, uh, weak, weak floors, timber uh, uh, floors. And what we try to do is simulate this building with Remuri. And you see here the model of the building. Uh, we use the commercial version for the simulation of the in-plane seismic behavior of the building that you see uh, uh, over here in the model. And uh, what we try to see by subjecting the building to uh, a pushover analysis is at least in plane with different load combination. We try to see what is the fundamental failure mechanism, what is the strength capacity, the displacement capacity of the building. We found these uh, base year values for different horizontal displacements. And of course, we illustrate here the first year uh, failure on this wall base based on the a concentration of stress in this world due to the weak diaphragm function of the building. So in order to, to improve this deficiency of the building, we try to propose some uh, solutions that are, uh, actually can lead to the um, improvement of the current behavior of the building. And you see over here what we propose is uh, a solution that is uh, based uh, on the um, increase diaphragm retrofitting of the building with a low carbon concrete addition on the top that you see over here are uh, basically a concrete the six centimeter thick concrete layer is uh, added uh, the concrete is uh, defined as low carbon because it consists of uh, um, uh, granulates from demolished buildings and recycled steel and what we found out there is that uh, this can effectively um, uh, increase the uh, uh, shear capacity the strength capacity of the building as you see, the, the different diaphragm retrofitting solutions we tried vary from the uh, timber retrofit case of the same thickness, let's say six centimeters, um, that leads to a, also some increase in the strength deformation of the building, a strength uh, capacity of the building, then with the green line, and then with the uh, red line, we see the red solution of the retrofitted building with a low carbon concrete that led to a substantial increase in the shear uh, capacity of the building. And then we compare everything with a pure concrete solution, which means that we replace the timber beams with the concrete beams and we see how, uh, what would be the shear uh, displacement uh, pushover curve of the building. And in, in that way, the commercial version has proved to be very efficient of uh, simulating retrofitting solutions of uh, varying materials and uh, thicknesses. So uh, the second solution that we proposed is that uh, emerging from the fact that uh, one part, uh, one big part of the energy uh, uh, behavior of the building depends on uh, the walls and the heating losses due to 
uh, due to the uh, poor energy performance of the walls. And what we try to do there is propose a, a novel solution with timber beams that are uh, infilled with bio-based materials, bio-based panels. We tried several uh, bio-based solutions such as uh, grass, uh, grass, uh, uh, natural grass panels, for example. And uh, we combined this by attaching uh, timber beams to the facade of an existing masonry building. Uh, we infilled this uh, timber uh, beams with uh, bio-based thermal insulation materials with attractive uh, thermal insulation properties and at the same time low carbon footprint and we try to, to measure uh, what the result is. So uh, this was a part of a collaboration with uh, Dr. Stelios Calioras this semester. Uh, basically we, uh, we co-supervised a, a master student at ETH Zurich uh, and of course, we uh, we used uh, the, the, the uh, research version of Tremuri to simulate the out-of-plane seismic behavior of the building before and after the retrofitting using, uh, you see this model on the left for the unretrofitted case, and this movement of uh, these models on the right for two different variants of uh, timber beams, uh, one with more timber beams, uh, two vertical and two horizontal, uh, that were simulated using elastic beam elements, and another uh, variant too with uh, uh, less uh, timber material with only one uh, vertical uh, element. And you see that by, by doing this, basically uh, what we the, the result was is that we, uh, we managed to um, reduce the heating demand and uh, uh, therefore the annual operational carbon emissions of the building substantially due to the use of the bio-based insulation uh, more than 20%, as you see over here, with both retrofitting variants. At the same time, due to the use of uh, bio-based materials, we can achieve uh, negative carbon footprint values. Uh, you see here the negative carbon footprint values for the two variants that basically create an attractive uh, behavior in terms of environmental impact. And, uh, uh, of course, the most important element, the improvement of the seismic a response of the building out of plane due to the activation of these uh, timber beams that we managed to model uh, in, in Tremuri. And you see here the ground motion excitation, the displacement out of plane, the top for the unretrofitted case with a black line, and then the displacement that was reduced using the retrofitting uh, uh, timber beams uh, using the two variants. You see the different uh, uh, evolution through time. Um, we managed to reduce the displacement of the building. And we, if we view the results in terms of a NIDA curve uh, by scaling the ground motion intensity and measuring the top displacement uh, levels, we can see the substantial reduction of the maximum displacement uh, of the uh, facade of the wall, at least uh, for the two retrofitting cases that were investigated uh, in this uh, study. And you see here the maximum displacements and the reduction due to the uh, two different retrofitting cases with a, a red and the green line. So what are the conclusions of this work? Basically, what we presented here is a, a synergetic seismic and energy retrofitting strategy that leads to substantial improvement of the seismic and energy behavior of existing URM buildings uh, using low carbon footprint materials. Um, they presented. A hybrid seismic design strategy can lead to the low cost and sustainable seismic protection of structures for various seismic hazard levels in developing and developed, developed countries using materials that can be easily resourced. And this numerical simulation is the challenge in in-plane and out-of-plane seismic behavior of the URM buildings critical for the assessment of the efficiency of the presented strategies. Tremuri uh, was very uh, um, efficient in, in capturing this uh, in-plane and out-of-plane behavior uh, in that sense uh, using um, the, the timber bags and the uh, different uh, diaphragm retrofitting strategies that I uh, present. And as the end, my vision for civil engineering focuses on the development of performance objectives for our community subjected to climate change. There is also the energy crisis at the moment, deterioration processes and natural hazards what we expect the people, the infrastructure, and the economy to do. Within this frame, the development of this sustainable design, assessment, and retrofitting strategies that are based on the state of the art of engineering practices and computational techniques lays the foundation for the implementation of this multi-performance synergetic research approach. And along this line, my research aims to offer 
a new multi-performance and synergetic assessment and maintenance paradigm towards the development of sustainable and resilient communities. And with, la with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and for the honor of inviting me in this uh, session. Oh, thank you, uh, Anastasis, because of the, your, your contribution is really valuable. And I think uh, in this case, uh, uh, special and unique in the, in the panorama of the, the speakers. And also, I want to thank you in particular for two aspects that are part of your presentation. One is uh, definitely that, that uh, you, you have shown the use of Tremuri in an advanced research project with an important uh, goal. Uh, important not only from the specific research purpose but also for i think the uh, economy and the and the, the future of our uh, our countries in particular in europe uh, the second uh, reason why i'm thanking you because is because you are implicitly stated and remember that uh, seismic safety is part of sustainability i mean we we have to to to, to remember this that uh, is a, this is an important uh, uh, consideration that uh, the, the, the seismic classification of buildings uh, is uh, is not less important than the energy classification of them. And looking at things together is a, a very interesting and important, uh, let's say, viewpoint and a way to, to focus uh, properly the, the situation. Thank you again. Thank you very much. I. I I uh, would stay uh, with the Greek presenters <laughs> and I give the floor to Mr. Georgios Papadopoulos uh, who's uh, going to talk about significant masonry buildings in northern Greece and I think this could be also very very interesting and uh, showing us uh, other types and, di and different types of buildings that could be of interest for all the participants. Thank you very much, Professor Pena, for the introduction. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we see the PowerPoint. We don't see the presentation. Okay, now it is the presentation one. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction once again. Good evening, everyone. My name is Georgios Papadopoulos, and today I'm going to hold a brief presentation about some of the most important and demanding projects that we designed in our company in the field of masonry structures. Today's agenda begins with some information about myself and the company and continues with the presentation of three case studies that we designed in our office. The first one being the St. Nicholas Monastery in Porto Lagos, followed by the, a block of flats at the Carolo Beer Street in Thessaloniki, and concluding with the Roosevelt Building also located in Thessaloniki. I got my diploma in structural engineering from the departments of civil engineering and the Aristotle University at, of Thessaloniki. After that, I completed a two-year master program at the Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, which gave me the opportunity to deepen my knowledge in masonry buildings, especially because my master thesis was in the field of them. And it is worth noting that this was also the first time that I encountered Premuri during my studies. Following the completion of my studies, I returned to Greece and parallel to my working life as an engineer of the praxis, I'm also enrolled as a PhD student at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in the field of structural dynamics for stone masonry. A few things about our company. It is located in Thessaloniki and was founded by my father back in 1989 and is an office for both public and private projects. Among other fields of structural engineering, we also specialize in the design of steel structures and especially the value engineering at cost of optimization of them as it is very important today due to the high cost that the material saw due to the crisis. To begin with, I'm going to talk to you about the West Building at the Porto Lagos Monastery of St. Nicholas, which is located in Vistonida Lagoon. 
The building I'm going to talk about is the one that is to be seen on the bottom left corner, as it was originally built back in 1910. Tragically, due to a fire in the mid-1950s, it was burned to the ground, and after that, it was completely redesigned, but this time as a one-story building, as is to be seen in the middle picture, uh, from, from the remains of the old structure. It is very worth to note that this monastery belongs to the Vatopedi Monastery in Mount Athos, and this, is, this makes this very significant for its location and its history. Our, our scope of work in our office was to design the, the one-story building in Tremuri and to propose if it, it was possible to add the second story and the roof from the original design and to make some changes in the original plan of the ground floor. For, uh, the next project I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about, as mentioned before, is the Carolu Deal block of flats, which is located at the corner of Metropolia Street and Carolu Deal in Thessaloniki. It was built in 1924 as a two-story building, and the rest of the four floors were added in 1938. The project that we designed in our office was a private project and was the reconstruction of an apartment located in the second floor of the building. The scope of our work was to check in conjunction with the architect if the demands of the client, meaning that he wanted some openings, some strengthened uh, bearing elements, and etc. Uh, we tried to, to, to see if his, if his demands were to be met. Due to this, we had, of course, to redesign the whole building and implement it in Tremuri. Uh, as you can see, it is a very demanding building, not only geometrically, but also because due to its history that it was built in different times, many materials and different materials and classes were used. Uh, luckily, because to the techniques that we that Tremuri offers, we achieved to meet the demands of the client. Here you can see in the previous slide some of the pictures during the construction phase and some of the specimens that were taken in order to check the classes of the materials. The last project I'm going to show you is also the most iconic one, and that is because I kept it in the end. It's called the Roosevelt Building, and it's located at Eleftheria Square in Thessaloniki. It was built during 1926 and 1927, and it originally belonged to the Ionian Bank Limited. Uh, it, is, it is a very iconic building for Thessaloniki, and it was its used changed during the years. During the, the war, it was used as the headquarters of uh, the, the army. And after that, it, the Ionian Bank was absorbed by Alpha Bank, and very recently the, the whole building was acquired by an individual, so I cannot reveal more about its future use as it is the wish of the customer. The scope of our work was to model and analyze the whole building and propose a retrofitting program. The work is still in progress. Uh, the building in itself is very complex, not only because of its geometry, but also because the large number of materials that were used. On the ground, on the, on the basement, uh, we see concrete blocks that go all the way to the second floor. The, the very peculiar thing is that these blocks made of concrete contain uh, stone 
may, uh, taken from rivers as aggravate, but also rough stones mixed with the cement. And there is no uh, reinforcement to be seen. Continuing to the inner of the building, we can see the normal reinforced concrete elements, beams and columns. And uh, it is very complex because, as you can see here with my pointer, there is an atrium. Uh, the mid floor is supported on very large beams that are to be seen here. The, the, center, sl the center slab is a composite slab made of steel elements, uh, masonry blocks, and filled at the top with concrete. Uh, the, the, the materials was, were, is, are very scattered, so we have an ongoing research process uh, for, for, in order to define the classes. Uh, the, 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 um, the, no, the, the notes, the, the, the original design notes and the, and the drawings that we found uh, differ from each other during the phases. We many many beams and uh, and columns were not uh, shown at the at the last designs that we found. So we have to make a very extensive research program in order to be sure that the demands of the client are going to be met. Luckily, even though the, this process of the research for the materials is still ongoing. I have, we have finished with the geometry of the building. So you can see it here how it is developing from the basement till the top floor. Without Tremuri, it was, it, we, it was not going to be able to design this. So Tremuri was once again, as before, the only way to go for this project. Uh, so to conclude with, I would like all I would also like to mention that the all of the three projects that I've shown earlier were subjected to earthquakes during their history, some of them minor, some other major. But what is worth mentioning is that their pathology is very, very, very limited. So this makes us wonder about the capability, the capabilities of masonry, stone masonry, masonry walls. And that is because the, the research that the universities carry is still ongoing and very interesting. Last but not least, I would also like to thank the organizers for letting me hold this presentation and the local distri distributor ErgoCAD for the effortless and continuous support that we get during every project. At that point, I would also like to thank you and wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you, Georgios. Uh, I think that everybody has appreciated very much the, all the different cases you have shown and the different the difficulties that have been solved in the issues that have been solved using Tremuri in all these uh, specific cases uh, and also together with the previous case I mean I think uh, that we can uh, cover many of the different uh, uh, differences that uh, can be can be found in within the European building stock that uh, offers certainly uh, a large variety of structural solutions implement and what we call together measuring structures but actually the, the, this, this definition of measuring structures means a number of very different things thanks again uh, i think that now we have the intervention by jacopo scacco just to interrupt the series of greek presenters Hello everyone, I am uh, Jacopo Scacco, I am PhD specialized in masonry structures and now I am an analyst software installator. Today we will talk about the module arch that is present in Trimuri project, we will talk about it uh, and its future updatings and we will talk about the theories that uh, are behind uh, this module. 
Let me recall briefly what there is behind the, what is Tremuri project. It's an uh, intricate software that allows a global analysis of the structure and the local analysis of the structural elements themselves. And in particular, today we will talk about the module Arch that is already present in Tremuri project and that will be soon uh, updated. Let me cite this proverb that uh, should be Indian. I'm not sure about this. Uh, An arch never sleeps. And this, in my opinion, uh, explains in few words the beauty of the structural element arch. Because uh, for one, for an arch, in order then uh, it maintains its functionality, it's necessary that each element, uh, each stones of the arch, uh, plays its role. The arch is able to sustain the external loads by an internal distribution that follow a path. This path is called the trust line and is uh, the, um, a polyline that connects each resultant point of the compressive force acting on each uh, interface. So the arch is able to sustain external load only under compression. As I told you, we have already Arch in Tremuri project, uh, will be soon updated, uh, and, there are, and um, it provides um, a wide range of features, tools, uh, and possible analysis. Uh, I wanted to remark that it is possible to analyze arches with any different shape, um, and it is important, uh, it will be possible to analyze the arch in its uh, reinforced scenario and reinforced scenario with composite materials like FRP and TRM. Then uh, the user can uh, uh, choose uh, a wide range of analysis, uh, starting from static analysis that basically provided, uh, provides the um, trust line and much more than we will see. And then we have cinematic analysis, where the main output is the collapse mechanism and its relative multiplier. But uh, in this case, uh, the analysis is uh, um, provided both for static and seismic loads. Concerning the seismic loads, it's also available a nonlinear cinematic analysis that uh, um, put at disposition of the user the evolution of the collapse mechanism. I want to highlight that the, all the analyses are performed accord, according the Eurocode 8 and the NETC Italian code. This uh, presentation is done also for uh, showing you which is the theory that is behind this module arch. The theory that is behind is the classic theory of limit analysis that uh, Eyman find out was applicable also for mesory structures. Indeed, uh, the problem of the arch that is only apparently a simple structure uh, the arch has been studied since centuries from scientists, architects, engineers, starting from Hook, uh, citing Coulomb, Mascheroni, Mary, until arriving to Eyman. Eyman stated that this classic theory of limit analysis that uh, uh, they were used to be applied to steel structure were also successfully applied, applicable to masonry arches. Only if some specific assumption uh, were ensured. What I mean? The masonry has not in size strength, so it's a notation material. The compressive strength is considered unlimited. This what it does mean? It means that usually the level of compression of stresses on masonry structure is low compared to its uh, compressive strength, so we can consider this unlimited. And then, this is important, the sliding failure does not occur. We don't consider sliding failures in arches. The first theorem uh, of the classic aesthetic, uh, uh, the classic limit analysis is the safe theorem, or we can, uh, um, we can call it the static approach. What does it mean? It means that uh, if we are able, if we have an external load and the arch is able to respond to this external load with internal forces, 
that are in equilibrium with external load and they are bounded within certain limits. In the case of the arch, the limits are the border of the arch itself. If we are able to find this internal distribution of stress, that external load is a load that is for sure lower of the real loss load or at the maximum is equal. So in another way, this is the this is the reason why Heyman called this uh, the safe theorem. The structure is safe if we are able to find this internal distribution. This is the uh, the static theorem. The safe theorem is at the base of the first analysis that is uh, um, provided to the user in our module arch. That is uh, defined as trust line analysis. This module uh, permits to obtain the optimized trust line. When I talk about optimized trust line, I need to make a step back because the arch is a redundant structure. So this means that the number of solution of trust line that we can obtain is infinite. So what we provide to the user is the optimized one, that is the trust line that minimizes the distance between the medium line of the arch and the trust line itself. It's a very useful tool because it's a very fast way to notice uh, uh, the location that might suffer damage and it's a fast way to understand the safety state of the arch. There is not only the um, trust line as main output. Uh, first of all, it will be possible to input to pre-existing cracks. And this is uh, obviously very noticeable, I would say, because uh, when we treat a real arch, uh, the cracks are often present. Then it will be possible to plot internal action and internal stresses along with the trust line, and it will be a main output present also the trust at the springs and this is fundamental when we want to um, uh, make a, a computation uh, for example considering uh, the outer plane of a wall or if you want to design a tie and then uh, last but not least uh, there is a list of safety factors uh, that are related to geometric uh, um, consideration that is uh, um, the uh, ratio between the eccentricity and the height of the arch itself and then there are safety factors that are related to the mechanical properties so namely to the compressive strength of the material now let's talk about uh, the cinematic limit analysis uh, that is the twin of the static approach of uh, the classic uh, theorem of limit analysis. In this case, uh, we assume that the arch has uh, a collapse. So we need to assume a collapse mechanism and in order to get the value of the external load that uh, lead to this uh, collapse mechanism, we need to put equal to zero the, ex the work of the external forces. The load that we obtain from this procedure is a load which value is for sure major, major of the actual ultimate load or at least equal. I want to just to remark that in the case of the arch, the arch is, as I already mentioned, a redundant structure. It's a three-time redundant structure. So in order to obtain a mechanism, we need to input, impose four hinges, at least four flexural hinges. In the case of an arch loaded symmetrically, we need, in order to have a collapse, five flexural hinges. This is the theory. Now let's uh, see what the modular arch uh, um, gives to the user in terms of cinematic analysis. The main output, output of the cinematic analysis is the real mechanism collapse. This is thanks to a very fast and uh, um, efficient iterative procedure that the software does in order to provide to the user the real collapse mechanism with the correct localization of the hinges. I would say that the power of this analysis is the possibility to explore the maximum capacity of the arch in few seconds. 
Furthermore, uh, it is possible to input uh, pre-existing hinges. Uh, when uh, I call hinges, I mean uh, crack completely developed. Then, uh, as main output, uh, the user, we will see the thrust uh, at the spring immediately. And then, uh, for uh, con relating to the um, to the seismic analysis, so under horizontal load, it will be possible um, to consider the seismic contribution of the feeling and the variable loads. And then, if this is uh, uh, remarkable, uh, it is possible to run the analysis on a reinforced, a reinforced configuration in static and under static and seismic loads. <laughs> Let's conclude the theoretic part of this presentation citing the uniqueness theorem. The uniqueness theorem assesses that if you are able to find a thrust line that is internal to the arch, so this means it is an equilibrium state, but this thrust line touch the arch in four different points, so this leads to a mechanism, that thrust line is unique. With our software, with our module arch, this is possible. When you are going to compare the results by using the static approach, by using the cinematic approach, you will be able to get the unique trust line. And this is important because it's a sort of valid internal validation of the software. Let me conclude with this last slide that I mentioned in the first slides, and it's related to the possibility to run nonlinear cinematic limit analysis. When uh, with this nonlinear, I mean that it's possible to crack the evolution of the collapse mechanism under seismic loss. So we have uh, the safety factors that in this case, uh, they are in terms of displacements, and uh, the user can visualize uh, the graphic evolution of the collapse mechanism and the evolution of the collapse multiplier. Even in this case, like before, it is possible to perform analysis on a reinforced and reinforced configuration. With this uh, slide, uh, I finish this presentation. I hope that it was uh, interesting to talk about uh, Arch in general, and in particular of our module Arch, that uh, I want to repeat, it will be soon updated. So thank you again for the attention, and uh, I leave the desk to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this uh, interesting contribution. Uh, Jacopo, I think he's uh, online, or even if the... Yes, thanks, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Jacopo. The, the, your presentation was really clear, and uh, I, I think you have presented an interesting new uh, addition to the, to the Tremuri project uh, package, and I think that the development could be also further, and this is a uh, a new interesting uh, uh, feature. Um, yes. then I, I, I think that we can now continue with the Greek speakers. We go to Stiliano Scaglioras. Uh, he is uh, Greek and a little Italian because of this. <laughs> Yet. Adopted, adopted. Adopted, exactly. <laughs> And uh, Stelios so, uh, has been one of my PhD students. He did his uh, uh, MIS uh, master's in, um, in Pavia and, and uh, his PhD at the Rose School in, in, in Pavia. Yes, correct. I've been working with uh, Professor Penna. Uh, for many years, and uh, I've done a lot of research using Tremuri. So today I'm going to present you a case study uh, on numerical assessment of uh, the seismic behavior of measured buildings uh, subject to the 2012 Emilia earthquake. This is a case study carried out uh, a few years ago uh, under the supervision of Professor Penn, Professor Magenes, and Dr. Paul Moran. Uh, he was uh, carried out using the research version of Tremuri, the so-called academic version of Tremuri, 
Tremuri is um, under constant development and some of the futures of the, the research version uh, hopefully in the future will be implemented also in the commercial version of the software. So a few, a few words about the study I'm going to present. Uh, the study was motivated by, by post earthquake uh, observations of uh, damage uh, on buildings that uh, on measure buildings, modern measure buildings that were designed, were not designed. Sorry, 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 sorry for interrupting you. Can you share yes. your screen? Yeah. Ah, yes. Second. Yeah. Uh, so screen. Okay. Um, I, we, we see, I guess, your desktop. We see a macro screen. element drawing. Okay. Now you see the, yeah, yeah, you see the presentation, right? Okay. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, the study was motivated by post echo observations of damage in uh, modern measure buildings that uh, uh, were uh, designed with no seismic considerations. Um, a set of buildings was uh, selected for deeper uh, for detailed investigation and we did some seismic verification studies applying the current uh, uh, standards, the Italian standards, the European standards, and we noticed that um, the maximum tenable epigronal uh, accelerations resulted significantly lower than the uh, shaking uh, that the buildings, uh, the case buildings, experienced the site. The 2012 mm earthquake uh, gave us the opportunity with, uh, by providing a unique uh, damage data set uh, to model the, the seismic behavior of uh, real buildings and to quantify the conservatism plan, the, the current code design procedure. Um, so the study was uh, um, articulated in uh, many different uh, phases. Uh, at first, we developed... Uh, do you see my screen, my, my presentation? Yes, because my computer crashed. Do you see my presentation? You confirm that you see my presentation, right? Okay. Um, so first we developed the numerical models um, to carry out simulations of the earthquake scenarios of different earthquake scenarios for the 2012 million uh, earthquake. Um, then uh, we perform a fragility uh, study uh, based on the existing analytical model-based procedures. Uh, we conduct uh, a reliable probabilistic seismic performance assessment uh, accounting for uncertainty in both social capacity and demand. And in the last step, uh, we uh, attempted to evaluate the safety margin provided by the, the current building codes. In this presentation, I will focus mainly on the first two phases of the work, um, which were centered around the, uh, using the Tremori software. So uh, for, the, for the development of the study, we, we used the equivalent frame modeling strategy. Um, uh, where possible, we adopt experimental data to update our models. Uh, we validate the models um, using empirical data uh, by performing uh, uh, simulations of uh, earthquake simulations, and uh, we derive fragility, fragility functions using state-of-the-art uh, procedures. Uh, in this case, uh, we selected three uh, real buildings uh, from the which are located in the province of Modena. Uh, two of these buildings, um, after the, the, the earthquake of uh, Emilia, uh, didn't uh, suffer any uh, damage, while the third one uh, results significantly damaged. And if I'm uh, not uh, mistaken, it was also demolished. Uh, here you can see some of the damage. Uh, observed in the, in the third building case, uh, which was a severe damage in the front and rear facades, which was also the weaker, uh, it was a weak uh, uh, building direction. 
Um, we, um, for the art modeling purpose, we use Tremuri, the search version of Tremuri. Tremuri has been successfully using numerous uh, studies in the past, has proven uh, um, that uh, to simulate the vision of accuracy and dynamic response of entire buildings. Um, we adopt the frame type representation of the in-plane response of walls. The out plane response was not explicitly accounted in this case. Such an assumption was considered acceptable uh, for the analysis of these buildings. Whereas if the diaphragms and uh, low wall uh, uh, height to thickness ratios rendered the out of plane uh, uh, response a secondary concern. Um, each wall uh, is modeled by assembling PSS pandering beams, uh, represented by two node macro elements connected by rigid nodes. Um, this is the, the nonlinear macroelement model developed by Professor Andrea Perna and uh, um, Stefano Bracchi. Uh, it has been improved uh, significantly in uh, recent years. Um, the macroelement is divided in, um, in three parts, a central body, where only CL deformations are possible, and three interfaces, where um, external degrees of freedom are located and permit axial deformations and rotations with respect to the extremities of the central body. Uh, the flexural rotating response of the panel is represented by adopting a unilateral uh, contact model. Zero length springs are located at the interfaces. They follow a panilinear uh, constitutive model compression uh, with no capacity in compression. Uh, along this way, the explicit evaluation of how cracking affects the rocking uh, motion. Uh, the model includes a nonlinear path for rocking uh, behavior that accounts for the effect of uh, limited compressive strength. Um, the rule is characterized by an uh, unloading branch with a slope equal to the, the initial stiffness, uh, thus allowing uh, uh, increased energy dissipation and the ability of modeling uh, deformation accumulation. Uh, the CA response of the panel is modeled through a constitutive law expressing nonlinear um, uh, nonlinear response, uh, nonlinear relationship between uh, CA stress and um, relative horizontal deformation, as you can see on the, the, the plot on the left, on the right. Um, the lateral strength provided by uh, the shear that is provided by the shear model results from the application of the equivalent long type uh, criterion with a uh, parameter suitably calibrated to be macroscopically representative of the um, uh, shear failure mode with uh, the diagonal cracking through bricks or step cracking with uh, sliding uh, along the joints. Um, the mechanical properties of the macroelements uh, were um, uh, updated from uh, in situ tests. Uh, we performed some in situ tests uh, for the determination of the mechanical properties of the, the mass wheel. Uh, where possible, experimental information was also, uh, past experimental information was used. Um, the macroelement mechanical properties. Uh, were based on mean values uh, of the mass material properties. Uh, drift limits were defined after statistical processing of uh, experimental data, and the phenomenological parameters of the macro element uh, were um, uh, defined after um, uh, model calibration against the um, uh, in plane quasi static cycle tests uh, performed in, um, in the lab. Uh, we performed some uh, pushover analysis to identify potential damage mechanisms and uh, the most vulnerable parts of the, the, the buildings. For example, this is building. Uh, this is the first building that um, uh, didn't exhibit any, any damage. Um, you can see that uh, the, the resistance of the building in uh, the longitudinal direction is significantly higher than the, the transverse one uh, due to wider piers and um, greater. Uh, gravity loads. Uh, this is due to the orientation of the floor. Uh, by the way, I, I missed to mention that um, uh, in all three building cases, the, the diaphragms are rigid, they are reinforced concrete slabs. And uh, everything was also the, the presence of ring beams. Um, this is the, the third building case, the, the building that exhibited the damage. Uh, you can see 
um, uh, a short story mechanism, the first story, uh, significantly lower the lateral resistance on the, uh, the beginning direction that um, exhibited most of the damage. Uh, with this pushover analysis, we uh, later we uh, define uh, damage limits, uh, consulting also uh, criteria uh, in the existing literature and in um, the, the norms. Uh, based on this uh, limit states, uh, we, we later uh, proceeded with the uh, performance fragility analysis. Um, to, to carry out uh, uh, the earthquake uh, uh, simulations, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, many available uh, uh, recordings. Uh, we had to generate recordings uh, using different methods. Uh, we came up with uh, around 15 uh, earthquake records um, generated uh, through uh, stochastic stochastic uh, ground uh, response analysis uh, with uh, modification of cell organs working at the uh, nearby seismic stations after um, spect using spectrum matching techniques and um, uh, we also use some synthetic accelerograms generated using uh, seismic source and earth class uh, models uh, we perform dynamic analysis thank you to the analysis um, in uh, most of the cases, uh, as you can see here, we saw that uh, um, the, the analysis results confirm what we saw in reality. Uh, this is building case one. Uh, in almost all cases, the building results with uh, zero damage. Uh, only in a couple of cases that the seismic input uh, seems to be uh, a bit overestimated. Um, the, the model uh, so that uh, the building uh, uh, manifests some uh, slight damage. In uh, building case three, though, uh, in almost all uh, analysis, um, the model shows that um, uh, it, it shows that uh, the, 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 the building suffered significant damage in the in the invulnerable uh, direction. Um, we perform Monte Carlo simulations uh, for the generation of use of uh, building models. Um, the geometry was treated deterministically, uh, while uncertainty was introduced by varying uh, mass and mechanical characteristics that present significant variability. We also varied uh, some drift limits for uh, uh, the drift limits for fermi shear fracture uh, and um, the, the, the vertical loads uh, um, carried by by the mass of peers. Uh, I will not enter into details. We perform around 1,200 pushover analysis for each building direction. Uh, on um, the generated pushover curves, we identified damage limit states based on the criteria uh, we discussed before. Uh, these limit state uh, variables were uh, summarized into an estimate of um, a central value and a measure of dispersion. And we're approximated by assuming suitable parametric uh, distributions, in this case, log normal distributions. Um, using the earthquake signal programs that uh, we saw before, we perform chemical dynamic analysis to come up with uh, probability distributions of the special demands. Uh, in our analysis results, we saw that the uh, greater was the special due to the record record variability. While well, dispersion in, um, in dispersion demands due to uncertainty in uh, structural modeling parameters was uh, really small. Um, fragile functions uh, were later derived by folding together probabilistic representation of capacity and demand using a state of the art procedures uh, available in the literature. Uh, I will not enter into details. Let's take a look at the, the results. Um, Starting with uh, building case one, uh, the building appeared to be weaker in the north south direction. This is because of, uh, uh, as we said before, orientation of the floor. So, in the, in the longitudinal direction, uh, vertical loads uh, sustained by the piers were greater. So, greater was also the lateral resistance. Um, 
wider appears, um, while in the other direction uh, we had the um, wider openings uh, based on the fragility analysis results. Um, this building should uh, suffer uh, with um, relatively high probability slight uh, uh, structural damage uh, in its uh, weak uh, uh, direction. Um, in reality, we didn't see any uh, damage in the building. The building case two, um, also here, uh, the fragility analysis uh, showed some uh, damage in both building directions. Um, despite the fact that there was no uh, damage in, in reality. Uh, this building was significantly more resistant in both building directions with respect to the other two building cases. And this is building three. Um, the fragility analysis actually predicted damage in the, the weak building direction or the, the, the structure. Um, in most of the cases, uh, this near collapse conditions, um, while only slight damage was predicted the, the, the strong building direction. So, um, after conducting this study, um, we, we predicted the, uh, the models predicted the, um, quite accurately the the damage uh, seen in the building case three. Uh, building uh, one and two appeared uh, slightly weaker compared to the observed seismic performance, but this converged zeromatics. The analysis results most probably attributed to uh, overestimation of the effective uh, intensity of the, um, the seismic motion that we employed. Um, maybe important because there were the assumptions on the, um, in the adopting uh, material parameters and um, the adoption of uh, strictly defined damage limits or um, a low uh, ultimate drift limits uh, associated with intensity of field modes. Uh, nevertheless, the studies show that um, uh, Tremuri can be effectively used for probabilistic analysis using high quality data and seismic input. Um, uh, the, um, models um, in this case were validated with the real uh, earthquake observations uh, using the uh, empirical data from the Emilia 2012 uh, earthquake and um, the results are quite promising for um, uh, similar studies of this type uh, for seismic vulnerability studies, seismic risk studies uh, can be performed uh, relatively uh, fast with low computational effort and uh, with um, quite high uh, accuracy and reliability. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm uh, here to answer them. Thank you, Stelius. Uh, I think that uh, your presentation uh, as the, I would not say something about the things because I know uh, what is the, the work behind, but uh, I, I think that it is very important to, to see how the tools we use have some degree of conservatism or how do they compare to reality or to experimental test. And in this case, I think that the more advanced version of the program, uh, the, the one with with more uh, with less conservative inside is slightly conservative mm -hmm. so this is uh, is something that uh, from one side tell us that uh, what we use normally uh, provides some some extra conservatism with respect to what we assume in the, when designing uh, but from the other side uh, it also tell us that maybe we should go a little further towards the use of more advanced tools and to introduce more advanced features to, to be less conservative and to be uh, closer to, to reality. Thanks again. And last but not least, uh, the only Italian speaker, 
Uh, Marco Tondelli. Marco Tondelli is uh, one of my former uh, master students. He is the first man in the world running more than one million pushover analysis in a single uh, master thesis. Uh, uh, I think that uh, he managed to, to, to share his screen. And uh, the topic of his, of his presentation is modeling timber based strengthening for URM buildings, but the application is not Italy. Is on building in the Netherlands. Please, Mark. Thank you, Andrea, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we hear you. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Stadata. I want to thank Stadata and uh, Professor Penna for uh, inviting me. Uh, as Andrea said, uh, I'm a consultant uh, in the field of earthquake engineering and uh, I collaborate with an uh, Italian company which is based in Pavia, it's called Sismica 360, uh, which specializes in uh, the seismic assessment and design of uh, uh, structures, especially um, unreinforced masonry structure. And my presentation falls into the framework of a collaboration that uh, Seismic has been uh, running since 12, uh, 2018 uh, with a Dutch partner company, which is called uh, A Construct. And uh, I would like to thank the take the chance to thank them uh, as well. Uh, this collaboration focuses on the seismic assessment uh, of uh, structure which are uh, based in the Groningen region and which are subjected to induced uh, earthquake. Uh, as uh, many of you may know, well, Groningen region is located in the uh, north uh, east of the Netherlands and uh, is uh, quite peculiar uh, because uh, um, there is a seismicity induced uh, by gas uh, extraction. Uh, the earthquakes over there may be not major earthquakes as uh, we can be uh, used uh, to, uh, for example, in the case of tectonic earthquakes. The problem there is that the structures are uh, particularly vulnerable since the structures over there uh, are designed only to withstand uh, static loading. Uh, so over the last, uh, I would say, more than five years, there has been a huge engineering effort toward the seismic assessment of the vulnerability of existing structure and the retrofitting uh, of uh, uh, existing uh, structure. Um, I think it's also important to underline the fact that uh, uh, due to the peculiarity of the problem, um, the engineers uh, in the Netherlands uh, should use a specific guidelines. So uh, over there, uh, we don't use the Euro code 8, uh, but a specific di a guideline has been drafted, which is called NPR 9998, uh, uh, and uh, is uh, specific for the seismic assessment and design of structures which are located in the Groningen uh, region. Another important thing to underline is that this guideline was first drafted in 2015 and uh, underwent several modifications over the years. The actual version is the 2020. Uh, version and uh, over the years we observed quite a significant increase of the uh, displacement capacity of structure when analyzed uh, with the nonlinear analysis pushover uh, analysis. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have that the seismic input of the region uh, is defined starting from here yeah, we see the web page of what is called the NPR uh, web tool and. Um, also, on the input side, there was a significant variation over the years. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, the extraction of gas was reduced, so also the seismic input, input was reduced. Uh, it did not reduce evenly on all the region, uh, but uh, there was a more significant reduction in the uh, peripheral areas. Um, so the peculiarity of the Dutch problem right now, the Groningen problem, is that uh, uh, the same structure uh, assessed like five years ago or right now uh, would have a quite significant uh, uh, different outcome uh, due to on one side the increase of the capacity and the other side uh, uh, the decrease of the demand. As we have seen at the beginning uh, in the presentation from uh, Stadata, uh, well, the Dutch guidelines are included in Tremuri in the commercial version. So, uh, here today I'm presenting uh, results about the, the commercial version of uh, Tremuri. Uh, so you can see in here that the NPR 9998 is included 
uh, in the in the Tremuri commercial uh, software. I would like right now to underline some peculiarity of these uh, uh, guidelines, uh, especially because many of us, as Europeans, uh, we are used to Eurocode. So there are some differences which are um, bigger from the NPR to the uh, Eurocode. Uh, first of all, uh, there are three failure mechanisms for major repair. So shear failure for the joints, shear failure bricks, and flexural failure. What is important to underline in here is that uh, uh, these three mechanisms are associated to uh, drift limits which are significantly higher uh, than the Eurocode 8. For example, the shear failure in joints is associated to a 0.75% against what is 0.4 in the Eurocode, uh, whilst uh, um, the shear failure in bricks and the flexural failure, they have a variable uh, drift limit which is generally never lower than 1% and can reach up to 2%. So you can understand that the displacement capacity which can we can obtain over there is uh, significantly higher also because uh, we assess structure at the near collapse limit state not at the significant damage uh, another point is that for shear failure uh, the npr 9998 uh, uh, underlines that both sections of the um, so the top and the bottom section of the meso repair uh, should be uh, verified uh, another big difference is the uh, bilinearization of the pushover curve. Uh, I would say the major differences are three. Uh, the first one is that the intercept for the definition of the period is at 0 0.6, the shear capacity. The second major difference is that the ultimate displacement capacity is defined at the 50% drop of the uh, maximum shear. So it's a significant difference with respect to the 20% drop that we have in Eurocode. And uh, uh, the third thing is that the uh, equilibrium of the area is performed considering the displacement at 80% drop. Uh, so we also in terms of bilinearization, uh, we push a lot uh, the uh, capacity. Uh, then other uh, differences uh, that we have uh, are, uh, for example, uh, the possibility to take into account uh, uh, the soil structure interaction with trans which translate into an increase of the displacement capacity of the structure. Uh, the use of gamma factors to the transformation factor from a single to multi degree of freedom equal to one for structure which are two stories or lower. And then another important thing is that uh, uh, the Dutch guidelines underline that the structure, uh, the seismic assessment should be performed uh, with the capacity spectrum method. Uh, now it's important to say that this method was originally conceived for the design and not for the assessment. So uh, there are some issues, I won't go into detail uh, in this presentation, but there are some issues when using this method um, for the seismic uh, assessment. Uh, also, there is the possibility in Tremuri uh, with the Dutch guidelines to use, uh, well, the N2 method, we are all familiar with that, but also with the modified N2 method, which was uh, uh, performed, um, developed uh, at the University of Pavia uh, by one of the postdoc of uh, Professor Andrea Penneth, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Guarini, which is called the uh, modified N2 method. This method basically corrects for the fact that usually with N2 methods, we tend to uh, underestimate the displacement uh, demand for really short period uh, structure. So these are, I would say, the main point to underline uh, about the Dutch guidelines, and all these points are integrated into the commercial version uh, of uh, Tremuri. Um, as I said, the structure in the Groningen region, they are quite uh, vulnerable, and uh, they are quite vulnerable uh, for several uh, reasons. For example, they have uh, big openings, uh, they have cavity walls, so uh, double walls with void uh, between the two leaves uh, where the outer leaf is non structural, and they have uh, some of them quite peculiar configuration due to the fact they are uh, agro building, uh, so farm uh, building. Uh, the most common retrofit measures, well, they are really uh, varied. Uh, one retrofit measure that I've seen is basically not retrofitting, but demolishing the whole structure, especially if it was in bad uh, condition of restoration. We can see a picture in here where only a facade was kept and then the building was turned into a, a timber structure. Uh, adding HSB, stiffening the floor or the diaphragm, uh, adding HSB uh, walls, this measure can be used either to, um, let's say, improve 
local uh, failure and the global failure and also a quite uh, typical solution over there which is quite local is this quake shield solution uh, which is adding uh, carbon fiber strips cutting slots into the masonry and then you can either uh, well add them uh, also with some reinforced plaster just to prevent uh, the out of plane failure or you can anchor them uh, into the slab and the foundation if you have the case and in that case you can also improve the in-plane uh, capacity of the measure here. Uh, here today I will present uh, a simple case uh, stu uh, study, well very simple compared to the uh, really big structure that we have seen before from the other speakers and uh, it's just a simple case uh, where I want to show you uh, how we have uh, uh, implemented in uh, the commercial version of Premuri the retrofitting of a structure with uh, uh, timber shear panels. So you can see the structure is very basic, one floor, square footprint. Uh, we have uh, a second floor, but is uh, uh, enclosed by the pitch roof. Uh, so we have no structural masonry over there. Uh, we have 210 uh, masonry walls on the perimeter, a main inner wall 100 millimeter uh, on the, let's say, Y direction, no structural walls internally in the X direction. And this is, uh, uh, the spanning uh, of the diaphragm. The diaphragm can be considered as rigid because there was uh, previously already a stiffening intervention uh, with the USB uh, panel. Uh, so we perform the seismic assessment using the capacity spectrum method in the uh, actual condition of the structure. And uh, first of all, I would like to underline, as I said before, that uh, due to the code as it is, uh, we can obtain significantly large displacement capacity for the structure. So if we uh, run the analysis, we obtain uh, this point 42 millimeter as a, a ultimate displacement for the structure. The truth is that the particular attention must be paid by the engineers uh, if there is local stability or collapse of some elements which can trigger local collapse of the structure. For example, in this case, we can see this pier in here on the right hand side, which corresponds to this corner in here which is actually collapsing at this point. And so we stop the analysis over here because uh, we consider that the failure of this element uh, will could trigger a local collapse of the roof since the roof is uh, supported by the perimetral uh, walls. So particular attention has to be paid uh, when using this code, especially because it's pushing a lot the capacity in terms of displacement and to the 50% drop. We can also see that uh, the drop in here corresponds to more than 20% drop with respect to the maximum shear capacity. So these results are more in line with what we would obtain with the uh, Euro uh, code. So finally, we can see that in the X direction, the structure is uh, not uh, very fine. So we need to uh, strengthen the structure. While in the Y direction, since we have quite a lot of walls, the structure is uh, uh, safe. Uh, okay, yeah, we have a zoom in of the uh, results. Um, as I said, the idea is to uh, actually use uh, timber uh, panels so to improve the seismic stability of the structure. So uh, the idea is to replace uh, two non-structural walls with the new HSB walls that will be properly connected to the foundation and to uh, the existing diaphragm, and then to uh, change the internal configuration uh, of the structure on the left-hand side, adding a new HSB panel. This will allow us to have enough uh, length of uh, panels to resist uh, seismic forces. So uh, the interesting thing in here is how to model uh, this panel. Uh, there is a MSC dissertation uh, which explain how to account for uh, this uh, HSB panel. So basically the timber panel is turned into an equivalent uh, uh, element, uh, an equivalent frame, you can say, uh, where we have some rigid element inched at the extremities uh, that they define the geometry of the panel. And then we have an, a diagonal, which is actually the element that controls the lateral stiffness and strength of the panel. Uh, the definition of the diagonal depends on several factors. The most important, well, this is the formula. The most important are the fasteners. So if you use nails, screws, uh, the spacing, and then also on the sheeting, uh, all down, side down, stud, and the connectors. Anyway, with this uh, transformation, we can, for each panel, uh, define uh, an equivalent uh, panel. And so this is the model and how we have implemented the solution uh, in Tremuri. 
so you can see uh, we have uh, the equivalent panel uh, realized by rigid uh, elements. Uh, then uh, we define the diagonal in order to define the proper lateral uh, stiffness and strength uh, for these uh, uh, timber panels. Uh, it's important to underline that uh, we had to introduce some offsets uh, which are rigid elements inched at their extremities in order to avoid introducing parasitic moment and forces uh, into uh, the model and to have only, uh, let's say, shear that is going into uh, the equivalent uh, panels. So here we can see the results of the uh, stiffened structure. So we can see right now that all uh, the analysis uh, are verified. I think the most important is to compare the pre and post retrofit intervention and compare the two curves. Um, I must underline this intervention does not affect the measuring. In fact, we see that the ultimate displacement capacity of the pre and, pre and post intervention is actually the same because it's controlled by the failure of this element uh, in here. What uh, is affected is the shear capacity, which inc is increases significantly, uh, and uh, well, the period of the equivalent uh, structure. Uh, we can see that uh, the curve of what we call we could call the hybrid structure is quite peculiar. So we have the first phase where uh, we have loading the masonry, and then when we start cracking the masonry, we activate the timber uh, panels. Um, for this type of structure, it's non-trivial the definition of the uh, equivalent period of vibration because if we run a model analysis of the two models, we obtain exactly the same period here is uh, 0 12 seconds. But uh, uh, due to the bilinearization, the equivalent uh, bilinear curve has a significant, uh, significant difference. So we have 0 0.1 second in this case and 0 0.3 uh, second in this case. Uh, some one could argue that uh, a possible linearization could be done reducing the intercept and uh, catching the first elastic branch so when the masonry uh, remains elastic. Uh, we decided to go with the code uh, based bilinearization maybe mainly because it's uh, uh, more conservative and we obtain a larger uh, displacement demand. Uh, in order to show that, uh, well, I have prepared here three pictures. So this is the press uh, retrofit. This is the post retrofit with the 60% intercept uh, bilinearization. And this is the post retrofit with the 30% bilinearization. Uh, this vertical line really represents the displacement demand for three methods and two M and two uh, modified and two and the capacity spectrum method. So uh, what we see is that the structure pre-intervention is verified only with the end to method. So this is another peculiar thing. Uh, with this method, we would verify the structure while both the capacity spectrum method and MN2 method would predict uh, failure. Uh, here, instead, uh, we say we see the two uh, different uh, bilinearization. As I said before, with the first bilinearization, uh, we obtain a larger higher acceleration capacity but due to the larger period we have also a larger displacement demand so a lower value of uh, alpha uh, in this case instead um, we obtained a lower with the second type of uh, bilinearization uh, the important thing to underline is that with this type of intervention increasing a lot uh, the shear capacity of the resulting structure uh, we are get really close to the elastic range. So the three methods, they predict basically uh, the same displacement demand. And uh, the last thing I would like to say, uh, the, using the capacity spectrum method sometimes is uh, tricky for seismic uh, uh, assessment. Uh, as I said before, because uh, you can see in here that when we have acceleration capacity, which are around the uh, plateau for the maximum um, uh, Re reduction, so this is maximum elasticity, you, you can obtain quite a big drop or, or increase in the uh, displacement uh, demand, uh, which uh, means that a tiny difference in the acceleration capacity could induce big differences uh, in uh, displacement uh, demand. Uh, this last slide is to conclude to compare the pre and post intervention, so we can say that uh, uh, the, uh, with the three methods, uh, this slide just uh, underlined what I've said before. So 
that uh, uh, this uh, uh, retrofit intervention turned out to be effective for the strengthening uh, of the structure. Uh, and the still, uh, there are uh, some uh, questions when using the three different uh, methods and particular attention should be paid in uh, using the tree and choosing when to use uh, the tree. Um, with this, I conclude the, uh, my uh, presentation. Thank you uh, all for the attention. Thank you, Marco. Thank you again, uh, all the all the speakers. Uh, we have no other questions from the audience. I, I think that uh, this uh, three-hour session was uh, quite interesting and various. Uh, we have provided a say significant amount of uh, uh, say different um, presentation, different case studies, different application. But also similar application. I would say that uh, something would, which was shown by Marco was also, I'll say, compatible with uh, what uh, uh, was presented also from uh, in other presentation. In, for instance, for instance, in the presentation of uh, Anastasis Siavos had some similar uh, solution that could have been modeled in a in a in a way that is uh, say consistent with what presented by by Mr. Tondelli. I think we can thank everybody, uh, in particular all the participants that uh, uh, resisted till the end. I, I can ask you all to uh, to say hello and to I, I try to take a picture of all uh, all of us now. I will send you the, this picture with the final final slide of the of the webinar. I thank you again, uh, Professor Rita Bento, Professor Rocco Zarnic, Dr. Anna Simoes, Dr. Stiliano Scaglioras, uh, Mr. Georgios Papadopoulos, Mr. Marco Tondelli, Dr. Anastasios Ziavos, Dr. Stiliano Scaglioras, and uh, two times <laughs> and. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacopo Scacco. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I, I hope we can see you each other, see you in person as soon as possible. And uh, I also hope that uh, many of you will be uh, back with us uh, in the third Tremuri event next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.